for you guys. Hello to everyone. Uh, I'd like to come you here. Uh, this uh, lecture from biophysics. This is like the first lecture from uh, this year's line of biophysical lectures. If you are just watching it as a student of general medicine, if you are watching uh, this lecture as a student of uh, dentistry parallel, then it's it's uh, very likely uh, the second lecture. Okay, so in this lecture we are going to uh, handle it, uh, stuff like uh, measurements and error analysis and I'd like uh, to uh, very briefly and very gently <laughs> introduce you into some probability distributions in context of uh, biophysics and into some uh, very very basic statistics. Uh, so uh, this lecture is dedicated uh, both to uh, general medicine and uh, to dentistry programs. Uh, my name is Luis Stepanek. I'm just uh, an assistant lecturer and teaching assistant at the Department of the Institute of Biophysics and Informatics. Uh, our uh, Faculty of Medicine in Charles Lunde here in Prague. Uh, and yeah, to be more specific, uh, I'm just a member of the Department of Biomedical Statistics, which sounds uh, very sexy, of course, but we are just a small group uh, of uh, people, a uh, working group, let's say, we, we, who help uh, to deal with statistics in, for example, some uh, journal uh, papers and some uh, doctoral studies and so uh, to people which are located at our faculty. I'm also a, a PhD student at the Department of uh, Biomedical Informatics, uh, Faculty of Medical Engineering, uh, Czech University in Prague. I try to do the, uh, like a combined uh, PhD both at our Department of Biomedical Statistics and Department of Biomedical Informatics. Well, uh, this may be the reason why I'm just now here and I'm going to talk uh, about some uh, kind of measurement that analysis statistics and so on. Well, uh, so. Due to the current situation, which is uh, all around the world, very, very specific and uh, let's say badly predictable, uh, and uh, it uh, just changes very rapidly, uh, we have we had to switch our lectures to uh, online, uh, like make them on the fly. Uh, but uh, uh, regarding the laboratory practicals, we will see what the situation will be. But uh, definitely, the, uh, or at least it's, uh, it seems to be like uh, that all the lectures at this moment are going to be moved to online. And uh, some of them maybe will be just more interactive, like to be uh, streamed live on the fly. This one is recorded, but uh, definitely will be for you uh, available to, uh, so we can have. Uh, questions, uh, feel free to ask me on everything related to this topic. You can ask me uh, at uh, Microsoft Teams, which uh, is one of our basic platform for this uh, subject. Uh, also on, on Moodle, let's say, and of course on uh, my, my email, which, is, uh, which will be uh, published uh, at the end of this lecture. Well, so I think that we can try to start now. Okay, uh, since this uh, this recording and this lecture and slides will be available uh, online. There's a call phone uh, just uh, to make it formally and to make it officially, but it means that it's just a Creative Commons license. Uh, if you are going to share this uh, record, share this slides, you can, you can do it. There is no problem not to do it. Or you can, you can uh, feel free to do it, don't hesitate to do it. And there are some rules you should follow within this distribution. So you should uh, uh, still uh, apply this kind of uh, license. So you should, uh, let's say, publish my name or just to let let the, uh, the audience know that uh, this was like my work. Uh, NC means no commercials. So if you are try to just to sell it to someone, uh, you can try it. I, I believe that no one is going to uh, buy it. Eh? So but try to sell it if you want to. Definitely no one is going to, uh, to buy it. So uh, just formally, uh, there should be no commercial derivates of this presentation and this recording. And uh, ND means no derivates. Uh, it means that uh, if you are going to print this uh, slides uh, out or you are going to edit this video, OK, there is no problem. Feel free to do it. But after this editations, uh, it shouldn't be uh, spread, it, uh, for example, outside a uh, wall of your, for example, room or flat. Yeah, it means that, in other words, you shouldn't distribute it after any editation. So it should be, it could be distributed uh, within the, for example, link to my name or our department, but without any editations and also uh, without any commercial, for example, gains. 
Okay, so let's have a look at the internet outline of my talk, of my lecture. So the first part uh, will be dedicated to measurement and error analysis, it's something which, which is uh, very, very close to applied biophysics, applied physics in general. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, ways how, uh, how, let's say, this uh, uncertainty in biophysics and in physics in general, uh, let's say, uh, usually reported, uh, for example, in your work, in your uh, laboratory protocols and so on, in your laboratory works. Uh, we'll, we will also talk more generally about the uncertainty in biophysics because uh, I think I would say that uh, what is what we are going to study within this course, one one term, winter term course of biophysics, uh, the ways majority of all the rules and all the principles, all the, all the concepts in biophysics are based on deterministic, uh, let's say, deterministic way of thinking. So it means that uh, you are going to study some formulas and some principles, some concepts, some relations between, uh, for example, different quantities in biophysics, uh, for example, also some relations to human body and so and so on. Uh, for example, interaction between human body and environment and other physical factors and so and so on. And both uh, or most of these uh, relations and the properties and so on will be based rather on a deterministic, uh, let's say, way of thinking, deterministic paradigm. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, once we are switching to do the biophysics or biophysics more particularly, so it means that we are going to do some measurements, to, to do some readings, for example, to evaluate some measured data, and you would like to, for example, make some conclusions or some decisions based on the measured data. You have to uh, a little bit switch to different paradigm of thinking, way of thinking, because uh, you can you have to try to think outside of the box because uh, in uh, applied biophysics and, for example, biophysics and this, which is based on measurements, you have to. Uh, think more statistical, let's say, uh, more stochastically, because there is, in all your measurements, there will be, there will be a proportion, some proportion, larger, more or less proportion of uh, uncertainty. And uh, this is pretty much closer to uh, sciences like probability and statistics and some stochastic processes and so on. So these are like two worlds. Uh, because the deterministic biophysics is something, uh, or deterministic physics is something very, very close to, for example, classical physics, Newton physics, and also to biophysics, which is uh, usually uh, how it is usually taught at our faculty or at faculty which are not so much into mathematics and physics like uh, other for example, more engineering faculty and so on. But the second world is that uh, if you try to measure something or evaluate something what was measured in biophysics, it's rather uh, pretty cool. It's closer to statistics because you have to describe or try to describe at least the proportion of uncertainty in your measurements. So this is uh, this is the uh, let's say paradigm. This is just the problem uh, issue we have to uh, deal with. And the first part called measurement and analysis is the part which I'm going to talk about this issue. The second part, interaction with probability solutions, is this is something which is in fact, uh, relatively complex, but uh, in this lecture and for your purposes, because we are going to study medicine, not mathematics, not things, and uh, God protects you, but and not not statistics. But uh, this is yeah, this is just a part of statistics. And since I'm just a graduate from a statistical program, uh, besides the medical program, so uh, this is like complex, uh, complex, let's say, uh, area of science. But for our purposes, as I told you, we'll just pick up some important pieces of knowledge you should know about. Uh, especially, uh, I would say that uh, there are, for example, I would like to figure out, for example, several uh, important probable distributions. I'm going to explain this term, which are also connected to measurements and um, also to be more, more pragmatic to uh, some of the practicals. As I told you before, uh, I'm not sure how the practical labs will be this year, this winter term, uh, because we have to wait how the waters will be just, you know, uh, just a turbulent, uh, yeah, turbulent issue, rapidly changing uh, corona pandemic, but we will see. So uh, regardless of the fact if we are going to measure it like uh, 
offline, face to face, so using the measurement of yourself uh, by, by, uh, by the instruments in our laboratory tracks. Or you will do it like virtually by seeing some videos, watching some videos, and for example, you are going to be provided by some data, maybe that's the way how to, for example, overcome the, uh, the pandemic or just uh, some kind of maybe. Uh, lockdown, which might be uh, very, very likely going closer and closer. So still, we have to deal with some, uh, with some uh, uncertainty and with some uh, probability, uh, kind of, for example, of some of the tasks uh, which are prepared for you. Yeah. So some probability solutions. This is the step I'm going to talk about in the second part. The next part, apply statistics, is uh, something which is, which could be, for example, handy for you maybe uh, even outside of this, uh, let's say, course, because it will be just about some uh, way of uh, thinking in uh, data, displaying data, visualization, and so on. So, and some kind of like curve fitting, and uh, also with some uh, working with some derived for example, quantities, how to, for example, calculate something, which if, if in case that you measured some, something, and you would like to, uh, for example, evaluate or calculate some other thing, this is there is just all, you know, some linkage between these two uh, quantities. You can try to derive something. Uh, you can derive the linkage, and you can um, try to, for example, uh, make some uh, let's say conclusions based on the measured data. Uh, however, if you, if you would like to know something about derived data, yeah. the measured data, but you would like to evaluate the, some derived quantities based on some formulas. Yeah, so this is like. Uh, uh, outlook my my talk and yeah so let's let's start okay so now as I already told you uh, if we just switch the paradigm or <laughs> way of our thinking that uh, on the one hand there are textbooks full of deterministic rules and deterministic laws uh, which which in fact yeah they they describe the world we live in because, you know Newton physics mechanics kinetics and so and so on this is a real, a real based on Determines the kind of formula formulas you can see in textbooks. All all physical textbooks are full of this kind of formulas, and they are like there's for example one a dependent uh, variable is equal to for example some function of uh, other independent variables, and this is just a typical way of thinking for example for high school physics, also for college physics. Why not? But as I told you, if we are moving towards the practical and applied biophysics and physics in general, uh, this is far more about uh, uncertainty because if we are trying to measure something, we have to uh, take into account the fact that uh, all our measurements, all our readings we are going to do or we did, are, they did just include some degree of uncertainty, definitely, in each case, all of us. So uh, if we try to uh, report uh, this, uh, fact that there is uh, some level of uncertainty in our measurements and we know that there is some level of try to realize a situation that for example there is just an example uh, below that uh, just an example of a gold ring and you would like to obtain uh, you to know its mass and to uh, do it to know it we did three measurements three readings and we realized that uh, its mass is could be 17.46 gram or 17.42 grams, 17.44 grams. So we have three numbers uh, which are pretty close one to each other. It's a good uh, news, good piece of news, of course. And uh, but we'd like to know what is the true or the real mass of our gold ring. So how to calculate? Uh, I'm just going to talk about it a bit later. But uh, this is like uh, the typical situation. We would like to know something. Uh, yeah, some uh, kind of true value, uh, or just a real value of uh, a quantity, you can say, and sometimes an average value or, or expected value. Yeah, and uh, usually uh, to do, in order to uh, realize this value, this true or this real value, we uh, we do some repeat measures. It's idle case. Sometimes we have only a push option to make only one measure measurement, also possible. But uh, more optimal is to do repeated measurements and some, some, somehow try to evaluate the measured readings in order to get the true value or the expected or the uh, real value we'd like to know about. Uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, more into details. 
but uh, maybe now it's not hard to realize that uh, sometimes we are not able just to uh, would get closer to the real or true value because the true or real is absolutely unknown. Okay. It's, for example, something and even this example with the gold ring is this kind of because in fact we don't know what is the reference mass of this gold ring. If, if for example, it's not in case it will be just a gold ring, for example, absolutely defined, for example, defining what is, for example, a gram or something like a, a, a talon, it's, it's called etalon, yeah. then it, this is the only case that you can uh, know the exact value of its mass. But if it's just a, a usual ring, you can try to, you can just buy it, for example, in the market, then we don't know what is the true value of its mass. We can try to, uh, for example, realize what the, what the true real mass is by repeat measurements of this mass. Yeah, this is just the logic of the measurements in physics. Uh, what is also important is how to report uh, our measurements because this is a formula which is uh, very general, but uh, it's, it could be applied almost uh, everywhere in a physics. So if we do some measurement, uh, you can see there are two terms, best estimate plus minus uncertainty. And of course, some units which are appropriate to the given quantity we are just working with. So, best estimate plus minus uncertainty. Best estimate usually, if we have uh, repeated measures of the quantity of our interest, best estimate is usually uh, an average, just arithmetic mean. Usually, yeah, there could be some, for example, exceptions from this rule, but usually, very, very, usually, very in base majority of cases, best estimate is done uh, is given by uh, uh, by an uh, arithmetic mean. Plus minus uncertainty and uh, uncertainty term uh, is usually uh, determined by, uh, uh, it's usually, it could usually be measured by a metric of variability. Uh, it's just a common way how to report it. Uh, there are also some other uh, ways of some, let's say, quantiles or, or things like this, but usually we calculate some measure of variability. So if I uh, try to uh, I can just unveil un 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 the uh, next part of this uh, of this lecture, but usually answer is measured by a standard deviation or standard error domain. So uh, back to our example of the gold ring. If we know these three uh, readings of uh, its mass, we can try to uh, calculate the average. Uh, average. It's average. Arithmetic mean. This is just 1744. Yeah, 1744. And what is also here is that we just calculate the range of these three numbers. So the minimum is 17.42, maximum is 17.46. So this is just the interval when probably, based on our three measurements, the true mass of the gold ring is. So 17.42 to 17.46 in gram. This could be written uh, by, by picking up the middle number which is uh, in fact the arithmetic mean 1744 plus minus a half of the range so the range is from 1742 to 1746 if you do the difference if you subtract these two numbers you will get uh, 0 0.04 divided by 2 because uh, i used plus minus sign so if i'm going to plus uh, count it up or just subtract from this number I, I, ha I have to get these uh, bounds, these margins. So it's just the half of the range. So it's only 44 plus minus 0, 0, 0.02 gram. This is the way how we can report the, our, let's say, very, very, very uh, short example, uh, very illustrative example with the gold ring. And uh, just notice that it follows the formula like best estimate plus minus uncertainty. This estimate is given by uh, arithmetic mean, this, and uncertainty was here given by the absolutely the simplest uh, metric of variability, which is uh, called also min max or just a range. Uh, and it was it was, uh, it was divided by two because of the plus minus sign. So it is just a half of the range, half range. So uh, arithmetic mean plus minus half range. Okay, so. Two concepts, precision and accuracy. Uh, the uncertainty uh, in physics, and not only physics, is given by these two concepts. And uh, sometimes it's uh, feasible or uh, meaningful to distinguish between these two concepts. So, what is accuracy or is precision? So, 
accuracy uh, is, uh, in other words, just a closeness of agreement between a measured value and a true or accepted value. So in case that we know the true value, or accepted, for example, if we try to measure one more, for example, some well-known constant in physics, it could be, as, for example, it could be just a pressure glass, for example, to measure a value of uh, number pi, or for example, to measure gravitational constant, yeah, things like this, typical high school, typical high school tasks in, uh, in laboratories of physics. Uh, then we know the true value, and we also measure it by our own measurements, our readings. And uh, since we know the true value, we know our measured values, we can try to, for example, evaluate the difference between, or just the closeness between the true value and our value, yeah? And for example, in optical case, these two values are will be pretty similar, pretty, pretty close, uh, close one to each other. Yeah, so this is like the uh, accuracy. Yeah, it, of course, we would like to have uh, the best possible accuracy in, in a, each of our measurement. So uh, accuracy is, uh, so it means that the closeness should be at, 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 as high as possible. Well, measurement error is the amount of inaccuracy, exactly, because uh, the inaccuracy is just the opposite to accuracy. So if the uh, measurement error is high, it means uh, it's just to be like, estimated by an amount of inaccuracy. And the second concept, precision, it's just that if you measure, it's a measure of how well a result can be determined without reference, yeah, without reference to the true value. So in this case, we are, there is no necessary to know the true or theoretical or real value. Yeah. Uh, so it means how, uh, how, yeah, just how, how well could be determined. It means that, for example, if we, have, uh, if we are going back to our gold ring, if we have three numbers which are pretty close one to each other, and they are close because the only difference is on the, uh, la, uh, the on the second decimal digit. They are pretty pretty close one to each other. It's it's a, it seems that uh, the percentage is high. It means that the result measured result of our in, quantity of our interest uh, could be determined very well because okay we suppose that uh, the true value is somewhere in the middle of, the, of these three numbers and since the numbers are pretty close one to each other. Uh, the final result, the final measurement could be determined very, very well in this case. So you can see that in, uh, in case of precision, we are not supposed to know the theoretical value. Yeah, in other words, we can also uh, say that uh, precision is a degree of consistency and agreement among independent measurements, and that's pretty the same in other words. Yeah. So also degree, uh, degree of consistency. Since the numbers are pretty, pretty close one another, for example, there would be uh, the four number, like for example, uh, 18.50 uh, grams. You can see that this number, like theoretical, it would be pretty, pretty far, uh, pretty distant from these uh, three numbers. So the level of consistency will be a bit low, lower than in, for these three numbers. So this is a precision, and to Put these uh, co two concepts together, so both accuracy and precision, you can uh, try to write a formula for uh, best estimate and uncertainty uh, in the following way. We have accuracy and we have precision term. So accuracy term is the first one, which is pretty uh, connected, uh, linked to best estimate. And the precision term is D1, which is connected to the uncertainty term. So accuracy uh, is just the first number, it's just the point estimate of the true uh, value of mass of the golden ring in our case. And uh, since it is just a point estimate of this true value, it is linked to the true uh, value of the x or the theoretical value, yeah? because it's, it's also based on the closeness of difference uh, between the true value and the measured value. Plus minus and the precision term. The precision term is not uh, based on a reference or theoretical value, it's just based on a degree of consistency of the measured values yeah so yeah this this so the uncertainty in uh, applied physics could be for example decomposed into these uh, two components like accuracy and precision yeah, in other words just the best estimate uncertainty to be more pragmatic but it's uh, accuracy and precision we just to make uh, these <coughs> two terms uh, let's say more intuitive for you Let's suppose this theoretical situation. We have four targets and we have four archers. And 
The targets are like typical uh, disk targets, and the red dots stand for um, for hits or for the shoots uh, that, uh, that the the archers uh, the archers did, and the red dots mean that uh, they, they just uh, they shot shot the arc, shot the targets. Yeah. So in the uh, first case for archer A, okay, let's try to talk about accuracy and precision. Okay, what is the accuracy? Accuracy uh, in this case for the Archer A is that, of course, we suppose, uh, I didn't say it before, but we suppose that Archer, each of the, uh, each uh, one of the Archers just wanted to uh, shoot to the center of the target, say, of course, right? this is a premise. So, um, accuracy. Okay, this accuracy is very low in the first case because uh, if we try to write something like a uh, theoretical center of the red dots somewhere here, and it's pretty, it's pretty far from the center of the target. So accuracy is relatively low, and uh, precision, which is based on a degree of uh, let's say uh, consistency of the, uh, of, the uh, of the red points red dots, is also low because you can see that uh, are, they are just far one to each other, one from each other. So both accuracy and precision is slow from Archer. Archer B. You can see RGB uh, has a high precision because the points are relatively close one to each other, but they are pretty far from the center of the target. So uh, accuracy is low, but precision is high. Archer C, it's just optimal situation because uh, all the radars are pretty, pretty close to the center uh, of the target. So precision is very, very well, precision is very, very high in this case. And also, uh, sorry, accuracy is very high because it's pretty close to the uh, center target. And precision is also very high because the uh, points are relatively close one to each other. Okay? Archer D, uh, just a kind of unique solution because uh, uh, in fact, uh, the red dots are somewhere very, very balancedly distributed uh, around the center of target. Yeah, it's, it's relatively balanced. So the accuracy is uh, relatively high because this, let's say, hypothetical center of the red uh, dots is somewhere here. Yeah? So it's pretty close to the center of the target. But the, uh, so the accuracy is relatively high, but the precision is very, very low because you can see that the, the, the red, red dots are pretty far from from uh, one from each other, yes. Yeah. So precision is uh, low, accuracy is relatively good, relatively high. Okay, type of errors. Uh, also, it's, this is this is uh, relatively practical to know about. Uh, two uh, types of errors. Now we can distinguish these two type of errors uh, in this context. And we uh, talk about random errors and about systematic errors. Random errors are the ones which are usual statistical fluctuations in both directions yeah, in the measure data. Uh, and uh, it usually they are based uh, or they are just due to the precision limitations. So because the precision of our measuring instruments are limited. So by uh, saying this, we usually got some statistical fluctuations are about the true value we'd like to measure. And statistical fluctuation uh, in both directions, yeah, for example, sometimes the instrument going to overestimate or underestimate the true value we would like to measure. But if it's like balanced uh, in half of the cases, it's overestimate, in half of the cases, it's underestimate. It means that like we are in, we are averagely in the middle. So uh, we are able to accurately measure the true value. So these are just random, uh, random errors. Uh, since they are based on, uh, since they are de described by some statistical equations, they, are, they, they could also be treated by some statistical analysis. And it's a good uh, piece of news for us because it, uh, they could be reduced by averaging and also by, for example, uh, you go a large number of statistics. So the more uh, observations you uh, have, the more, the more readings you have, then usually. Uh, is the uh, some less impact of your of the random errors which are included in your measurements. It's a good piece of news for us. It means that uh, it's better to, in general, it's better to have more readings than than only a few readings. Yeah, it's it's pretty clear. I think it's pretty intuitive. But I am just going to show you how where, where is the mathematics behind this, why this works. 
is based on a law of large numbers. Well, so it was random errors. Random errors will be definitely all of us here in our, in all our measurements. So we have to deal with, deal with them. But as I told you, a good piece of news is that they can be reduced by averaging because average, as I told you, if the statistical is in both case in both our directions, it means that average by averaging the overestimating and underestimating measure uh, readings of the, of the quantity. They are usually the averaging means that we are going in the middle of somewhere between the over and understating measurements. Uh, it means that we are going closer to the true value. Systematic errors. Uh, this is a different kind of error because they are usually, uh, they, they should be reproducible. It means uh, two things. Reproducible, it means that if we are able to realize what the systematic error was uh, in our measurement, we are able to, for example, try to re redesign our experiment and our measurement to try in, in order to avoid it in the next iteration. And also reversible, it means that uh, yeah, in, uh, in the opposite way, uh, in the opposite case, that we are not able to realize that there is a kind of something error in our measurement. If we are going to do it more and more and more, uh, there, will there, will, there will still be the same systematic error. So they are usually consistent in the in only in one direction. So they are consistent in the same direction, only in one of them. So they consist they constantly overestimate or either overestimate or, or underestimate the true value. Uh, it's usually difficult to detect them because uh, yeah, to detect them it's uh, it usually requires to know very very let's say very much about the uh, physics behind our experiment, behind our measurement. It's, uh, uh, for example, difficult to know, uh, or it's, it's uh, based on, the, on some hard knowledge of uh, theoretical physics and all, for example, consequences there. Yeah. So it's hard to detect them if they, whether they are uh, in our measurements or they are not. And they cannot be statistically analyzed and they cannot be reduced by some statistical uh, for example, processing like averaging or so. Uh, <clears throat> correction can reduce the value. If, if we know, if we, for example, uh, able to at least, for example, after measurement, realize that there could be a systematic error, we can try to reduce its impact by some correction. Yeah, it, it's possible, and it could reduce the bias, which is uh, which is in our measurements when when there is also a systematic error. Uh, yeah, they can be detected or reduced by increasing the number of searches. So it's a good uh, point to know about because. It's simple to realize. If we know that uh, the, if there is just a static error in our one or more static errors in our measurement, then, uh, for example, supposing that it's constantly overestimated the true value in each of the repeatings, each of the readings, it's absolutely independent on the fact if we are going to measure it 10 times or 20 times or 100 or 1,000 times. It's absolutely independent because in each of these uh, repetitions, uh, regardless, you are going to measure it 10. Uh, 10 times or 20 times or 1,000 times, they are still here and still constantly overestimated to value. So it's, it cannot be reduced uh, by increasing the number of observations. Uh, what is a good piece of news that, that uh, is something? It could be avoided a bit, yeah, <clears throat> by, as I told you, by a uh, hard knowledge of the theoretical physics behind our measurement. That's the first thing. So yeah, this is really it requires also some experience yeah, with, the, the, with the practical physics and with the theory in physics. Uh, and by prior and uh, by, by careful planning and conscious planning of the experiment, and uh, like uh, also as a very, for example, uh, <coughs> let's say, uh, smart doing the, the measurement here. Yeah? So it could be avoided by this in some way. There are some consources of, uh, of, the, of the errors in uh, practical laboratory uh, physics. Uh, they could be uh, both systematic or random. I'm going to talk about some of them because it's like um, a little uh, topic which is, as I told you, it's really connected to the uh, knowledge of physics. So we are going to go more into the, the topics in the next uh, ongoing weeks, but just to make a, let's say, a short list of typical systematic and random errors, uh, some of them are important. So 
uh, the first incomplete definition, it may be snake or random. It means that if your, your measurement is designed poorly, yeah, it's not very well designed, it's very likely, there will likely be a systematic or also a random or, or what is worse, that there will be very likely a systematic error because you are going to forget on something, or you are going to forget on some uh, influencing factors, some environmental factors or some noisy factor or something like this. Yeah. So incomplete definition is like uh, something which is absolutely a big no-no and uh, for example in our practicals we believe that our uh, practical tasks which are prepared for you are well def defined and well designed so let's hope that this is something which is not like the issue you are going to face to it failure to account to factor factor it's typically it's typical for beginners in physics in applied physics it means that for example you can try to define your experimental measurement very well you can try to design the experiment very well uh, it's okay but still for example uh, due to the lack of some theoretical knowledge in physics we are going to failure to account to consider some of the factors which could for example influence your final measurements and still it usually leads for example systematic errors like an example uh, for example if you measure <coughs> For example, body temperature, uh, for example, in a, uh, let's say, a room where it's uh, relatively high temperature of air, yeah, like, the, uh, like something like this, it's definitely going to uh, in, influence uh, the temperature uh, you are going to measure on a human body, a given human body. It means that, uh, and if you are going to not, not take this into account, then definitely can try to uh, get, for example, overestimated now, uh, just, well, just yeah, overestimated uh, values of the, the body body's temperature. Environmental factor, yeah, th these could be random. These could be all systematic. It depends on the environment. Uh, usually, for example, some ambient noise, some ambient light, and so on. If if, if you try to, for example, do some audiometry, then some ambient noise from, for example, street which is close to your laboratory. This could, for example, uh, ruin your experiment. Yeah, there could be a problem. So if the, if, the, if the ambient noise is still there, it could be like a systematic area. If it is some sometimes, for example, on the street, sometimes it is there, sometimes it's not there, then it's like a random, yeah? But uh, or ambient, uh, for example, uh, ambient, for example, light, which is, uh, which was an issue, for example, for uh, an older type of glucometers, yeah, for example, because the glucometers were they're based on some chemical reactions, uh, which are based on some photometrics. And yeah, if there is some ambient uh, external, uh, for example, light, uh, if, you, if you just put the glucometer, for example, to your window or something like this, yeah, this also could uh, bias your uh, final measurements. Instrument resolution, calibration, zero offset. This is uh, related to your instrument, and it's pretty, pretty okay, uh, pretty, pretty clear. Calibration, zero offset. You know that uh, measuring instruments uh, usually need uh, time to time. They usually need to be recalibrated just to keep, for example, the its uh, keep its precision, for example, as high as possible. Still, is zero offset. Zero offset means that a calibration of zero sh should be still like uh, let's say appropriate yeah, to be still still precise as as I was saying at the beginning mm -hmm. uh, so like, uh, the, the default uh, default calibration yes resolution also something very uh, very similar to the, this these two issues they are usually systematic yes resolution could be random because it could be uh, for example uh, changed to both directions physical variations are is a usual random error so uh, usual random error it means that we are going to repeat your measurement, for example, uh, each Monday, let's say, and there are some changing uh, or you know, just varying changing uh, conditions, physical conditions in your laboratory. It could be, it could happen. Then it's like a random uh, influencing factors. Yeah. Parallax is something typical for astronomy, but not only for astronomy. It means that the observer, uh, which is, uh, which try to measure something, which try to measure something, is for example uh, pretty far from the measurement instrument or for for example at some uh, for example strange angle so uh, she or he is not able to 
measure uh, to do the measurement uh, to do the measurement uh, let's say appropriately instrument if uh, also something uh, similar let's say to zero and calibration issue uh, and so on and personal errors uh, of course this could be both a systematic or random if I, if I, for example do some due to some inattention for example if you do some rewritten errors or some personal errors with some basic algebra basic arithmetic here yeah, when you're going to calculate something it's usually random yeah because yeah it, it could happen yeah uh, so this is this is like something which could be avoided it, it will be also it's not if you try, if you are inattended to the to your measurement all the time it's like a systematic area so if you stay alert stay focused on your measurement you can try to avoid this kind of parallel error which tends to be systematic if you really if you are a little inattentive well reporting our measurement so this is the important part because uh, in your laboratory works uh, in the let's say uh, protocols we are going to uh, some assign to us submit for example for us uh, after the uh, labor laboratory task is done by you uh, there is a definitely be a way how to report your measurements and uh, let's say a good a good way how to do it is to follow this formula so measurement is uh, composed with uh, best estimate plus minus uncertainty and some minus. this is also we already seen this in the first slide and it could be already like accuracy and precision but this is like more generally yeah? best estimate plus minus uncertainty is pretty pretty uh, let's say handy formula which is good to know about the best estimate of the measure quantity is usually an average it should be like n sorry it's a typo so arithmetic mean or average uh, there are some exceptions I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> and the answer to the term uh, is completely differently because uh, there is a difference if we have only only one measurement, only one reading, a single measurement is the first case. And the second case, if we have repeated measures, repeated readings. Yeah. The second uh, case, second scenario, if we have repeated measures is, for example, um, of course, better because as we already uh, <clears throat> uh, seen, uh, if we have more you, the more measurements you have, the more likely you can you are able to reduce the statistical errors and these random errors here. So uh, now I'm going to talk about the both scenarios. So we have uh, the first will be just we have only one single measurement. It is possible. Uh, some uh, of course I consider that I, I would like to measure uh, the same quantity in all cases. Yeah. So I would like to measure one quantity. And the first thing is that I have only one chance to measure it. So I'm going to get only one single measurement, one single reading. And the second scenario is that I am able to measure it repeatedly. So I, for example, feel free more confident about the final uh, measured uh, for example, result. So the first scenario, how to report a single measurement. <clears throat> if we have only one measurement, it could be, for example, mark as x with subscript one, so x one of our quantity of our interest. Uh, then uh, the only one measurement is also it's only <laughs> only one best estimate because if we have only one measurement, we have absolutely no chance to work with or to calculate anything with one number. So if we have only one number, one measurement, one reading, this one reading, this one number is. Uh, the best estimate, the best and unbiased estimate of its average. Yeah. So the best estimate is this one number. Because we have only one number, so there is no way we have only one number. So this is already the best estimate. So it's as easy as this. <laughs> but uh, the tricky part is uh, so for the best estimate, it's pretty easy. We have one number. We have measured it one uh, only one time. Number. So best estimate is this one number. Okay, as easy as this. But the tricky part is the uncertainty term. Because if you have only one number, there is absolutely no way how to calculate uh, any measure, uh, any metric of variability or, or yeah, so, or variability or any measure, measurement or any metric of uncertainty. Because simply try to realize, uh, we need at least two numbers to calculate the range because we have to uh, subtract maximum minus minimum. Yeah, so at least two numbers to calculate, for example, the range or it's sometimes also called min-max statistic. Uh, to calculate 
standard deviation and variances I'm going to talk about it later, but to calculate also variances and standard deviation also need at least two numbers. And honestly, two numbers are still very, very low count here to calculate it, but at least two numbers to, technical, to be technically able to calculate it. So one number is absolutely not necessary, absolutely not enough. So uh, how to overcome this? We need to adopt uh, the some, uh, let's say, um, estimate of uncertainty, which is uh, something like a standard uncertainty. And usually we have to, uh, to search for some published, for example, uh, level of standard uncertainty for uh, this measurement, for, for measurement of the quantity of our interest. So we need to go into some instruments documentation or some reference book. Usually the instrument is uh, distributed together with the, uh, uh, the measurement tool, or the instrument. Uh, there are also some online reference books. You can try to Google for it. Do whatever you can, but we have to adopt the, the uh, uncertainty estimate from some external sources because if we have only one number, we are not able to calculate the uh, measurement of uncertainty. How? You know, if we have only one number. One number is one number, so we are not able to how far is this one number from something else because you have only this one number. So the formula for reporting is written like best estimate plus minus uncertainty level with some units. Best estimate is done by the only one number we uh, have measured. Yeah, that's it's easy. But the uncertainty is given by standard uncertainty of, of our measuring instrument. So once more, go go and search in uh, the documentation or in some reference book or use Google or whatever. As an example, <clears throat> uh, we would like to uh, measure a diameter of a tennis ball. We have just you know, some one, uh, one of the typical tennis balls, just green ones, you know, or yellow one, it doesn't matter. But firstly, you try to uh, uh, measure its diameter by a meter stake. And secondly, by a linear caliper, you know how it looks. It's a kind of uh, special. Uh, instrument which is uh, more precise than on the meter stick. So, since we are going to measure the diameter of, of our tennis ball only once, so uh, we are not able to calculate the measure, uh, the, the level of uncertainty, we have to adopt the distributed uh, information, the, the uncertainty as a distributed information, which is, for example, written somewhere. So, if we are going to use the meter stick, uh, the plus minus five millimeters is the published value of uncertainty for meter stick. And secondly, we are going to use a vernier caliper. The published value is, uh, published value for the, for its uncertainty is uh, like plus minus two millimeters. So uh, you can see that if we are going to use a let's say more precise instrument, we are going to, of course, get more precise uh, measurement, final measurement, no estimate of final measurement. So, these two numbers are like, for example, uh, Google, they, they just Googled, or the, for example, in case of vernier caliper, there is some documentation which is usually distributed within this instrument. So we can just try to refer in, in, the, in the documentation, because if you are going to measure only once, as I told you several times before, you are not able to calculate anyhow any metric of uncertainty. Now, Let's move to the repeat measures, <coughs> measurements. Um, it's a situation which is, for example, uh, I would say that it's like closer to optimal one because uh, the absolutely optimal is that we, have, we are able to measure something, for example, unlimited number of times, or at least a bit better one is that we are able to just to uh, realize what is the true value. Yeah? So. <coughs> Let's suppose that we have repeated measurements of the same quantity. So the best estimate of the true value is uh, usually uh, an average, so arithmetic mean. Uh, usually, yeah, uh, there are some rules uh, when this is usually, this is usually applied. Uh, because uh, from statistical theory, uh, if we have uh, this something called a rule of thumb, if we have 30 or more uh, observation, 30 or more readings, then you should be uh, confident enough that the distribution of your uh, of the mean of your measured readings should follow a normal distribution, just a Gaussian one, you know, just the bell-shaped curve, Gaussian one. 
and uh, then the mean is uh, unbiased and best estimate of, of the expected value. Yeah, it's like uh, this is just from a uh, asymptotic. Uh, this is just a con con consequence of asymptotic uh, properties of uh, normal distributions. Uh, y thirty. Okay, the from the theory of statistics, it's, it, it is to be calculated if you have thirty or more readings, then uh, uh, let's say. In percentage, the error you are going to uh, make if you are going to uh, to use just the estimate, uh, for example, uh, like your, number, your mean, uh, you are measure mean, the calculated mean as a, as an estimate of the true value. The, the error in percentage is uh, less than one percent to be derived from from statistical theory from the distribution standard normalization of normal. Of a, a normal uh, distribution function. Well, um, so simply, n measurements, n is larger than one, x1, x2, xn of our quantity, then mean is just, you know, this formula. Yeah. And I'm going to just calculate the array, uh, arithmetic mean, so I'm going to sum this number up, so x1 plus x2 plus the n, so on, so plus xn divided by their. Uh, number by their count, so divided by n, and this is just a formula for arithmetic mean. So this is not a rocket science. Uh, so this was for accuracy. This was for the best estimate, the first time here. This estimate is done by, uh, by arithmetic mean, and the term in terms of precision. So the second term level of uncertainty. Usually uh, we use standard deviation, which is um, Many times uh, denoted as an S, marked as S. Uh, it's commonly uh, commonly used, a uh, good estimate of, of uh, an uncertainty. Uh, it's like a going to variance, it's just a square root of variance. Yeah. So it's calculated divided. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, make this differences between uh, my observations x1, x2, and xn minus uh, the range. These terms in uh, the brackets are called deviations. Make a note that uh, they are they are power to two. Yeah, they are just squared. Because in case that I'm not going to square them, I'm going to if if just theoretically I would put only the first uh, powers of them. It means that I'm going to take them linearly, like identities. Just let them in the first uh, in the first powers. So there will be only x x, x uh, one minus. Uh, the average plus x2 minus the average and so on. So try to think there are no the, uh, the squares. Then it could be easily proved that this sum is equal to zero. Yeah, it's easily proved. I think that we are able to do this proof. It's not like an statistical proof. Yeah, because uh, crazy decisions usually love, love proofs on for example 200 of pages, say, but this one could be done in three lines. But it doesn't matter. Uh, so it from this reason it's power to two because if there are been there will be no the, the second powers the this summation of in the numerator will be just simple zero it's divided by minus uh, n minus one so for large n n minus one is pretty pretty similar pretty close to n so there is a difference it's it's this is something which is <laughs> uh, also based on some statistical theory why the N minus one, but if there will be only n, it it would also work for large n, but it would be a bit biased. Yeah? So forget on this. Just take it like it's a formula. Uh, it's a kind of correction, but uh, it could be there. If you are interested in, try to ask me uh, via email. I can explain why there's n minus one, n minus one instead of n. So and finally, it's just this fraction is calculated, and we are going to take a square root of this uh, fraction. Well, so this is just an estimate of uncertainty. So, uh, following the formula from the beginning, uh, best estimate plus minus uncertainty in units. I'm going to, to use an average as a best uh, Try to uh, notice that uh, average is usually noticed by x with a bar. Yeah, x bar. This this short line above the x symbol is uh, is called bar. X bar. Plus minus standard deviation. This is uh, an estimate of percent. It was just a uh, issue. Uh, make also make note that there are three different uh, options. I can put uh, uh, 
mean plus minus one standard deviation, mean plus minus two standard deviations, and mean plus minus three standard deviations. The second option, like uh, mean plus minus two standard deviations, is the preferred one, and the reason is uh, it's also based on some statistical uh, theory behind uh, the calculation of standard deviations. So, assuming that uh, there is a normal distribution of the measurements, but there is also one stronger uh, claiming. Uh, it's not necessary to have a normalization of the measurements, but uh, if we have enough uh, measurements, so 30 or more, then based on something we just called central limit theorem, uh, Lyapunov, Lyapunov variant of a central limit theorem, it's not necessary to have a normal distribution. So forget on normal distribution. In the, in, at this moment, it's like we are not supposed to know what is normal distribution. So forget on this. This assumption is better. But for large samples, based on something on a theorem which is called Lyapunov, Lyapunov version of central limit uh, theorem, this is necessary, and it could be proven that uh, within this interval, um, um, average plus minus two standard deviations, there is exactly uh, ninety-five percent of all values, all measured values, and this is really really strong claiming. Eh? It's good to know about because. <clears throat> If you know this, it means that you can just, uh, just uh, for example, control if, for example, uh, if we are, for example, standard deviation we have calculated is, for example, relatively small in comparison to your, uh, to your average. Yeah? Because in situation that standard deviation is uh, larger than, I mean, means that there is like a number plus minus two standard deviations, it means it will be just a number plus minus a bit larger number then we are going to get into negative numbers say, by the minus sign. Uh, it's pretty strange, for example, for quantities which are from natural uh, could, uh, could uh, be represented only by positive numbers. But uh, yeah, this is like a good, good to know. Yeah. There, is, uh, there, there, there is exactly 95% of all the measured values in the uh, my, uh, mean plus minus two standard deviation. So, um, 95% uh, is like pretty close to 100%. So, almost all values you can think of, think about in uh, uh, think about within the measurement of your quantity are within this interval mean or average plus minus two standard deviation. So, this is like a something which is a very strong claiming, very very handy claiming even for applied statistics, uh, applied physics. Applied statistics and applied physics is pretty similar. Yeah. Well, uh, work out, worked out example. We have a measurement of a piece of paper. We are using a meter stick to do the measurements. And we measured the paper five times. And we got numbers like 31, uh, 33 uh, centimeters. 31.15 centimeters, 31.26 centimeters, and 31.02 centimeters, and 31.20 centimeters. Then the average is, we're going to sum the numbers up, divide them by 5, and this is just the calculation of your uh, average. 31, uh, sorry, 31.19 centimeters. And also the standard deviation, so we have to calculate the de deviant, uh, deviations, means Differences between your uh, observations and uh, calculated mean. These they are just uh, calculated here. Some of them are like negative, yeah, but I'm going to take squares of them, so I just omitted the uh, minus signs. Sum them up, divide them by five minus one, square uh, take square root of this, and you are going to get zero at twelve. And the final way how to display or how to report your measurement is following this formula. Best estimate plus my sunset. And I told you to have repeat measurements. We can use this uh, exact formula. Average plus minus two standard deviations. So average is this number 31.19, uh, 31.19 plus minus, and this is like two standard deviations. So 0 0.12 multiplied by 2, by factor 2, I got 0 0.40. 24 something so this is like the final one so this follows the uh, formula of average plus minus two standard deviations and it's as easy as this 
Okay. Final mark, I want to remark about. Uh, sometimes, uh, if you want to report the variability of the average uh, estimate rather than uh, a variability of our sample, or a bunch of our uh, repeated readings, we use uh, something different in the standard deviation. And this is like uh, something which is pretty sort of standard deviation of the mean. Yeah, sometimes oh, it's rather called standard error the mean. But it's a standard deviation exactly for the value of mean, not for the whole sample. The S stands for standard deviation for the whole sample. And uh, since we are in, uh, here interested in only, in only in one number, exactly the mean number, you know, just the average, or the average of our sample, then we can uh, expect that the variable is lower than uh, the variable of the whole of the entire sample. And it is, it can be derived. It's also not so uh, hard to derive it, if you know how to derive central limit theorem. Uh, so uh, there is just a uh, equation uh, a relation between the standard deviation s and standard error of the mean sigma, sigma, uh, sigma mean. And you can see that uh, standard error of the mean is uh, lower than standard deviation for the, for the entire uh, sample. And it's lower by a factor one over square root of sample size. So if we have only one uh, measurement in your sample, this is one and this these two numbers are exactly the same, yeah. but with the whole period, if you only one number, you are not able to calculate standard deviation. This is something I told you. So, but for, for large numbers, for example, if we have uh, 100 numbers, uh, then standard deviation is something calculated from your 100 numbers, and standard error of the mean is uh, 10 times lower. Yeah, it's really, really good to know. And then the way how to, for, how to report uh, our measurement, if you are interested, exactly in the mean, is mean plus minus standard error of the mean. The best way is the, this option. So mean plus minus two standard errors of the mean. Yeah. But I think that uh, in our course, this is maybe not not like the case applied in one no no one of, of the tasks prepared for you. But it is good to know about yeah, because also you can see that. Uh, from this formula, uh, this is like a, if if we are if supposing that we are able to derive this proof that this is true and try to believe that this is true, we have no uh, room here to just to derive it. Eh? <clears throat> but you can see that the the larger is the number of my measurements, the lower is standard error of the mean. So in other words, the press the more precise is my estimate of my uh, average of my sample or my readings yeah. because the larger number is here the lower is the whole fraction so the, the lower is the uh, this is the standard error of the mean so the more precise is the estimate of my mean okay this is like <clears throat> uh, something which uh, should be listed because in foreign literature as a part which is um, usually uh, taught uh, in this in this uh, lecture, in this kind of lectures, but only like a short intro to this kind of um, issue or if I, this kind of topic. Uh, so far, all the missions were, were based on the fact that we would like to know something, for example, an expected value of a, of a physical quantity. And we measured it. We measured it once, only once, or we measured it repeat, in repeated times. Yeah. So it was pretty easy. The concept was pretty easy. Now, the point is that we are, for example, able to measure something, some quantity, but we would like to estimate, <coughs> uh, estimate, uh, for example, an expected value, or estimate, let's say, uh, just average of a quantity which is derived. Uh, from D1, which was measured. So this is like a kind of different concept. Yeah. For example, we are from some reason or another not able to measure measure the original quantity we'd like to uh, know about. We would like to know uh, its, uh, its average. But we are able to measure only, for example, some derived quantity. It's pretty, pretty uh, 
very, it's very, very common in, in applied in physics. So some, some of the, for example, values are not able to, some of the conditions are not able to measure, and they have to be on example, calculated. Yeah. So this is the, this is the typ typical example. And it, uh, the mathematical toolbox, which could be used to handle this, is called law of propagation of sunset. It's, it's like a, based on calculus. So forget on this. We are going to study medicine, we are going to study mathematics, so forget on this. But if you, I don't know, maybe sometimes somewhere in some journal article or whatever, if you're going to uh, see this, uh, let's say, term, law of rotation, you, you are going to know that it's uh, like a <clears throat> exact exact way of thinking or you know, deriving how to handle with the fact that we are going to measure uh, we, are, we would like to uh, know uh, an estimate for example, uh, an average of a quantity, but we are not able uh, to measure this quantity, but we are able to measure, uh, for example, some similar quantities which are linked to our quantity by some formulas, for example. Yeah. So based on some calculus and law of propagation or something, there could be derived some formulas how to then like, but you can see that there are, these, these are just a function of, with a multiple, uh, this is a multiple variable function, so we have to do some partial derivation. Forget on this. Okay, <clears throat> if you still got in a situation that you need to uh, calculate an average or just the best estimate of a uh, of a quantity that you are not able to measure, but you are able to measure some link linked or uh, quantities, there is uh, fortunately an easy way how to do it. So forget on law of propagation of uncertainty. And there is a, a second alternative, which is simpler. It uh, doesn't require any calculus. It's like a, uh, it's sometimes called street fighting math, yeah. Uh, so it's not like calculus, not like university calculus, college, college, college method, it's like a high school mathematics. And it's called the upper lower bound uh, method of uncertainty propagation. So uh, I'm going to uh, show it for you on an example. So let's suppose that we measured an angle theta, to, uh, which was uh, which we are we've measured several times, and we followed this formula, like best estimate plus minus uncertainty, and reported in this way. So 25 uh, degree plus minus one degree. So this is just best estimate. This is just uncertainty term, and but we would like to know not the theta. It's good to know the theta, but we are interested in cosinus of theta. So how to realize it? How to how to report the cosinus of theta if we know what is the reporting of the theta itself? So we are able to measure the theta, but we were from some reason able to uh, measure the cosinus of theta. So the approach how to handle with this is to <clears throat> calculate minimum possible value of the derived quantity. So minimum uh, cosinus of 25. <coughs> uh, so there is a type where it should be 24 degrees. Sorry for this. The minimum is, of course, 25 minus 1. There should be 24. Cosinus of 24 is uh, 0 uh, 0.9135. And maximum of this possible value. So it's just uh, 25 plus 1. So it's a cosinus 26. Also, I got some number. 0 8988. Sorry for this. There, there should be cosinus of 24. Yeah. I'm going to correct in, in the slides. So we got a mini, uh, minimal theoretical value and maximum theoretical value. And what we are going to do now is to reestimate the average. And like a good estimate, if we suppose that uh, the quantity is at least a bit symmetric, we can do it like summing these two values up and divide by two. Yeah, uh, maximum value and minimum value divided by two. It's just a reestimation of average for the derived quantity. Plus minus, and it's just a half range. I, I've talked about it on the first slide. So uh, it's just the difference between the maximum or minimum. It doesn't matter if maximum, minus, minimum, because you know that cosinus is inverse function. Uh, it's just a uh, negative modulus function. So uh, it's like a minimum minus uh, maximum, yeah, but it's an absolute value. So forget on the order of this in, in the subtraction. It's just the difference, and it's a half range. So we do it by two. And by this calculation, I got new estimate of uh, average of the derived function, so derived quantity, just cosinus of original theta, 
plus minus uncertainty term for the derived quantity or the, or the cosinus theta. You can see that I just got numbers which are somewhere in the middle of these two numbers and also the range is somewhere in the middle. So this is the way how to calculate it. It could be done by this law of progression standard because we are able to uh, derive uh, the number of formula for cosinus. We are able to derivate it uh, with respect to the theta. You know, there are some uh, listed derivations <coughs> with respect to the, uh, to the single variable. But forget on this. This is absolutely feasible estimate <coughs> in case that we are going to need it. <coughs> in Africa, signature is also interesting part, <coughs> also in, also important part. Uh, this is this will be easy, I promise. Uh, <laughs> significant digits. Uh, what what are significant digits, or sometimes called the significant figures? So significant digits are all the digits between and including the first non-zero digit, uh, supposing the decimal representation of a number. So uh, all the digits between and including the first non-zero digit from the left through the last digit. Yeah, it's as easy as this. So let's take a look at some examples. 0 0.44 has two significant digits. So first non-zero digit. For, this is just zero. So the first non-zero digit is the this leftmost four yeah, after the small separator, after the small uh, dot. And through the last digit, so four and four. There are just two significant digits. Yeah? Easy. Um, the second example, 66.770. So first non zero, six, six, seven, seven, and through the last digit. So the last digit here is zero, but don't be mistaken, it's still significant because through the last digit, we we just uh, don't care if the last digit is zero or it's a non zero digit. Yeah? Don't care. So through the last digit, so one, two, three, four, five. So it has five single digits, also easy. And there are some exceptions, of course, because we usually live in a complex world. Zeros are significant except when used to locate a small point. So in this case, I told you it's it's comprehensive, compatible with the first two, because uh these zeros like this one, this one, this one, this one, the four leftmost zeros are here just to locate the decimal point. And also we should start to uh, calculate the signature from the first non-zero from the left. So both the rules are, uh, in, they, just, uh, they are just compatible themselves. So no, not this one, not this one, not this one, three and zero. So two second digits here, yeah, because these zeros are here to locate the small points. This is this rule is derived from the first one. Yeah. So we could, you can just follow the first one. First non zero digit. So the first non zero is three. Sometimes zero may or may not be significant for numbers. Uh, this is tricky, but I'm going to explain it for you. So 1200. Yeah. So first non zero digit, it's just a one, yeah, one, two. And it, it could be that following the first rule, it will be just one, two, three, four. It will be just four significant figures. It could be. But try to realize just from practice that, for example, you use something, some in measuring measurement instrument, which was, for example, not <coughs> be able to measure uh, so pre so precisely, let's say. And, for example, it wouldn't be able to, for example, it, it, the, the measurement instrument uh, wasn't able to measure the last two digits. So there are zeros, for example by the lack of precision yeah it could be well, from some reason so it could uh, happen that there are only for example two or three or four things so this is like uh, this this could vary yeah there is a kind of special uh, special example so to avoid this ambiguity to avoid this confusion uh, such numbers should be expressed in a scientific notation to make uh, all the all this uh, for example uh, uh, confusing zeros, which could be or couldn't be significant, uh, to make them uh, like uh, numbers which are after the single point. So, scientific notation is something like this. So, 1200 would be rewritten as 1.20 multiplied by 10 power to 3. 
Again, as he says, so the first term is usually called significant or um, mantissa, and this is like a uh, yeah, this is just a e, sometimes called e notation because the ten is sometimes written like a um, capital E, yeah, for uppercase E. Uh, you know it from from Microsoft Excel. Yeah, but this is the way. And in this case, if I if I can see this, I can I can follow the first through like first non zero digit through the last digit. So one, two, three. Yeah, one, two, three. I'm not interested in, in this part. Yeah, this is just the um, exponential part. Forget on this because there are only zeros. So it's just this is something which is uh, here just to locate the symbol place. Yeah, it doesn't look like this, but it is. Uh, so one, two, three, three significant digits. If there will be only one zero two, there will be only two significant. If there will be one dot two zero zero, there will be four significant digits. And there is like a um, let me like intermezzo for you. You can try it on your own uh, to make things easier. There is a solution on the next slide, uh, and to make uh, things even a bit more easier, let's try to follow the solve it example. So first number. Uh, 456. Uh, <clears throat> so it's easy. I'm just going from the left to right. One, two, three, yeah, three significant digits because every non-zero is significant. It's as easy as easy as it is. 68 dot uh, 90, uh, 99. Uh, 29, sorry, 60, 68, dot 29, 1, 2, 3, 4, non zero digits, 4 single digits, also easy. 0 0.067. You know that zeros before non zero digits are never significant because they are they're only just located as a small separator. So these two zeros are not calculated and not, are not taken into account as significant. So only 6 and uh, 7, so 2 single digits. 700.0879. Also, there are zeros between non zero digits are all significant because they, they must be there. Yeah? Either to locate the, the small separator or just to just to make the uh, correct value the correct one. Yeah? So seven seven digits, seven significant digits, all of them are significant. 0 .0000008. Because the first six uh, zeros are there only to locate the single separator. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, yeah, we are, they are not just uh, considered as a single and then there's only one single. The last eight is the, is the only one single here. Zero dot zero 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 eighty. Okay. Also, first six leftmost six zeros are not single, but the last uh, zero is significant. So eight and last zero is single, so there are two single digits. Zero at ninety-eight. This zero is absolutely useless here. I'm sorry, and it means that there are only two signatures, nine and eight. Yeah, uh, four thousand. This is tricky, you know, because this number could be such a nice and rounded to the thousands because, for example, of the lack of precision of your measurement tools. So don't be mistaken by this, and. Uh, we know that there could be one or two or three or four signatures. It's it's not like it couldn't be like stated 100% uh, sure of this uh, notation. So we have to rewrite it, and there's a way how to rewrite it. 40 multiplied uh, 10 power to 2. The rewritten is correct, yeah, in case that these two numbers are equal. But honestly, <coughs> the mantis, mantissa, should be a number from one to ten. So this is not like too too much too much. Let's say correct in a final uh, at the end of the day. So um, like there will be two single digits, like four and zero. But uh, this is not the proper way how to do it. Yeah, forget on this. The proper way how to do it is the next line. Four dot zero multiplied that by ten power to three. This is okay because Monday size between one to ten. And these numbers are equal. Why not? And there are one and two digits, so these two are significant. 
827. Three zeros are there. No, no problem here. 82.70. All of them are zeros. You know that uh, I'm starting at the first one zero. They are from leftmost and going to rightmost uh, digit. And regardless of the fact that if the rightmost digit is a zero or a non zero digit. So one, two, three, four, four, zero, five, five. Uh, and the last four examples are based on the fact that uh, there is a problem, you know. In, in the first two, in these two, the mantis size larger than 10, so there's a problem. In this example, there is no problem. Mantis size be, between 1 to 10 or to 2, there are 1, 2, 3, 4 single digits. And still here, yeah, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 single digits. Uh, and the last thing which is uh, important to this kind of uh, stuff uh, 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 connected to error analysis and measurement analysis is how to use single figures uh, in a, let's say, propagation of a so in some simple arithmetic formulas, in simple arithmetic calculations. So there is something like a rule of thumb you should know about. I just uh, call it a rule of for rounding. In general, number of significant figures in a calculated value, it's important, in a calculated value is the same as the smallest number of significant figures in any of the original numbers. So, in case we are going to, for example, put what, two or more uh, uh, numbers, we are going uh, going to do some arithmetic uh, operations with them. Then the, your result, calculated result, should uh, have exactly uh, as much uh, as many significant digits as has uh, uh, the lo the lowest precise, just the low precise number you have cal you calculated with. So multiplication division. The rule is applied here. Uh, six, not six, multiplied by uh, 7,328.7. So there's just the, this is just the uh, uh, result we are going to get from the by a calculator by Excel or by some program. But we have to uh, round it because the number of uh, single digits for the first. The first number is two, one and two, and for the last is five. So two is lower than five. So the our result should have only two signatures. So I'm going to rewrite it in the scientific notation, and uh, this is the correct return. Uh, but the mantissa should have exactly two signatures because there are only two. This is a low. Uh, the, this is just the number with the. Uh, lowest uh, lowest count of uh, single digits, so only two. So there should be also only a two, only two single digits in your result. Additional subtraction, it, the result should be rounded around it to the last single place I wrote it of the for the least precise number. So I'm going to uh, sum up these two numbers. You can see that 54 is only uh, like an integer here. It means uh, that it has no decimal places. And it means that if I'm going to calculate this up, I have to around my uh, result to have no decimal uh, digits, so to make it also an integer. And this example, uh, the least precise number is the first one. It is only one decimal pl uh, place, one decimal uh, digit, so my result should also have one decimal. Place. So there is a uh, there is an issue that. By using Microsoft Excel or calculator or whatever, or a smartphone, if you're going to you know, sum up two numbers, your smartphone or Excel or whatever is going to give you unfeasible high precision, for example, to give you many, many, many decimal places, many, many decimal digits. But in practical uh, applied physics, most of these decimal digits are not easily yeah, because they are just only a product of this arithmetical operation. But we have to follow these two simple or this, this simple one rule to uh, make our, our results, let's say, more feasible. So this as easy as this. And last thing about the uh, error analysis, <coughs> uh, single digits and rounding and some particular uh, applications. So the first point is that the result should be reported with no more single figures than are Known. This is important, and this is what I have told you before a while, over half a minute ago. If you, if just a Microsoft Excel or your smartphone or whatever calculator is going to return you, uh, for example, a product of uh, arithmetic operations, which is 
reported for many, many, uh, within the many, uh, significant, uh, many decimal digits. Think twice about the, uh, appropriate number of count of decimal digits because many of them are like, let's say, useless. They are, for example, not, not, uh, not measurable. It means that, for example, if we are trying to, uh, for example, realize that we like to measure, uh, human body height, for example, for uh, one class of students, uh, you know that a human body is feasible to measure, for example, uh, with precision on centimeters or maybe two millimeters, let's say, but not to, uh, let's say, for example, I don't know, micrometers or nanometers or things like this. Absolutely, it's absolutely rubbish. So, for goodness, it is just a parallel to what I what I said too. So, uh, precision is. Precision should follow not only the empirical rules, but also this kind of common sense, uh, just something like common sense. Because too, which, when something is too much precise, it's like sometimes could be a kind of fish, yeah, because it is too much precise and the precision is like an artificial one given only by some ethical questions. So the so ratio should be reported with no more significant figures than are reliable and known. And external uncertainties are inherently impressive. So it means this is like the credo motto of this part. There is only some uncertainty in our measurement. So they are inherently imprecise. And they should be usually around to one or two or one or at most two significant figures, not more. And the rule of thumb for this is that if we have, if we have exactly any readings and observation uh, of our quantity, then experimental uncertainty in terms of generation, but just experimental uncertainty should be reported to maximum this uh, value of single digits. digits. Uh, there is just a formula. If you have a, a given value of n, you can calculate this. It's just a two times n minus one square root of this n decimal logarithm. This special uh, bracket stands for something which is called a floor, uh, floor of x. Which is just the largest previous integer. So it means that floor of 4.3 is just a 4 eh? because 4 is the largest previous integer. 7, uh, floor of 7 is uh, 7 because 7 itself is an integer. And um, uh, floor of minus 1.8 is minus 2 because the large value is not like minus 1, but this is minus 2 because it's just the left. Yeah, if we are oriented to our real, uh, real numbers on axis, then the large. Uh, the largest previous integer is the closest integer to our x, which is on the left hand side from uh, the x, from the x. So, uh, to make the calculations, mean that if we have uh, 50 or less observations, 50 or less readings, use only one significant digit digit in your uh, in your readings. So, supposing you are using a decimal representation of a number. If we have uh, 50, uh, more than 50, but less than 10,000 of uh, readings, use two significant digits. Uh, I would say that in our particular task, you are usually have, uh, you are usually going to have, well, let's say, 10, 20, maybe 30, maybe uh, readings. So it means that you, are, you should use one significant digit. Maybe it could happen that, for example, you will have more than 50, like rarely, but let's say in such a case, it is legitimate, you are legitimate to use two significant digits, but not more. So this is important because in our, if, if we are going to, for example, grade your submitted work from laboratories, sometimes we are, we see really, really precise results, which are absolutely uh, unfeasible. Uh, the precision is absolutely unfeasible uh, because it's, as I told you, it's done only by calculations in Excel. So it's uh, just artificial, uh, artificial, and uh, fake precision done by the arithmetic operations. Yeah. So uh, in physical uh, way of meaning, it's really unfeasible. Well. <clears throat> Now we are moving to interaction to probable distributions. I'm going to uh, speed, it, speed it up because this part is like uh, do, more into statistical science. But uh, we are just going to pick uh, several important pieces of information which are important for us and, and I also be interested for us. So 
the quantities like I don't know what they hate or remember number of um, emissions uh, of a radioactive source or uh, for example streamed um, <clears throat> electric or stream or whatever yeah electrical voltage measured for some reason uh, for example uh, <clears throat> in biophysics um, blood pressure or <clears throat> blood uh, sugar level and whatever whatever we want to realize <clears throat> these are usually complex um, quantities variables and we could uh, consider them as block, black boxes. And sometimes, uh, especially in biophysics, these variables are too much complex. That, for example, we are not aware on 100%, for example, of all the factors which would influence the, these quantities. Uh, so typical way how, to, how these uh, variables are uh, handled uh, is that uh, they are supposed to be like uh, random variables, which is a term from statistics. And the reason, and that's the reason why probability theory and statistics uh, they are supposed uh, by other uh, by other uh, scientists as the science of uncertainty. So physicians are pretty okay with the statistics and probabilities with some uh, let's say specific areas of physics, typically quantum physics. Uh, thermodynamics, uh, statistical physics, some physics of usually uh, gases and so on, so physical of some, for example, uh, lower values of pressures and so on. They are, these are based, also astronomy, uh, these are based uh, on, partly, more or less are based on statistics and physics are okay with this. For example, quantum physics like Schrodinger equations and um, equations of uh yeah just a, just a manner of particles they are absolutely based on like orbitals and uh, movements of particles it, this is this is 100 percent statistics yeah, because uh yeah this is uh, this is simple statistics uh, multivariate statistics so uh these areas like statistics mobility is usually applied in in physics and uh this is the reason why we should know about some important pieces of knowledge so to make some introduction to uh, random variable random experiment, uh, I'm going to over the skim over the surface. Yeah? I'm not going to go into details because this is like this will be um, yeah you yeah this is like not for you maybe. Uh, I I wanted to say that uh, for for students of medicine this is this could be like uh, more into mathematics and uh, this is not like necessary for you so i'm going to pick the important piece of knowledge okay so let's capitalize b random variable and we are interested in some notation uh, the notion is so, not so much important but uh, we know that the random variable could uh, use some uh, possible outcomes and in, uh, it, in its representation for example if i'm going to do a random experiment it could be realized uh, so i'm going to get a sequence of realization just a measure of space, but uh, let's take a look at the example. So, a random variable could be discrete. It means that if I have a y, uh, y1, uh, which is an output of repeated coin tossing, it means that my possible outcomes is only head or tail, yeah? Only these two possible outcomes. If I'm going to do the random, uh, random experiment four or more times, I can get head, head, then tail, then head, and so on. So, this is just a random sequence. Uh, given by a random repeating uh, uh, of the random experiment uh, based uh, on this uh, based on this random variable. Well, the, the next uh, discrete random variable is if, if we understand a number of detected particles emitted by a radioactive source in a given given one minute. This is something which which is uh, pretty close to one of the tasks in laboratories we are going to uh, measure and you're going to work on so uh, we know that the possible outcomes are just the yeah, because there could be uh, one part zero particle one particle two particles or just number of things could be uh, a positive integer or zero yeah okay but uh so there this is just the sequence of realization so i got 13 uh, in the first first measurement i got 13 um hittings hits then I got 10 hits, now 11 hits, 70 hits, and so on and so on. So I measured it. This is just like a, a artificial example, but 
now the numbers should be somewhere around uh, an expected value there. And the random variable could be also continuous. For example, a random number, uh, let's be set to one, just a random number from interval zero to one typical uh, problem in the computer science uh, pseudo, uh, pseudo uh, random generators. So uh, the outcomes are, is just the puzzle outcomes is just a number from uh, continuous interval zero to one inclusively. And these are the representation of multiple repetitions of this kind of random experience. So 0 0.5, 50, 0 0.83, 0, 0, 1, and so on and so on. For Z, Z2 should be, uh, could be a random leisure, systolic blood pleasure. Okay, we know that the blood systolic pleasure is just a, could be like a number which is positive. So to be more general, it could be just a number from interval 0 to uh, plus infinity. So these are, for example, uh, different systolic uh, blood pressures of different uh, classmates or one class of students. So I got 150, uh, 125 uh, millimeters of uh, or just tors, yeah, maybe easy to say, 138, 112, and so and so. Okay, well, uh, if we have a random variable, the random variable is usually described by some typical values or some, some typical, let's say, properties or measurements. So a random variable is just a, usually described by a distribution function. It means that just a probability that uh, my random variable is, uh, will be realized as a number lower than or equal to small x. Often it's uh, described by a probability mass function that it means that uh, it's typical for discrete variables that uh, is a probability that my number is equal to a given number x and with some average or equality values e x and variance bar x. And what is important that for large numbers usually if we have uh, the theoretical knowledge of uh, its average and theoretical knowledge of its variance it could be estimated uh, uh, using a sample mean and sample Variance because if I have standard deviation and I'm going to take square of my some uh, standard deviation, I can estimate vari theoretical variance of my of my quantity. Okay, and uh, just a repetition, or one repetition or one realization of a random variable procedure is called a random experiment. Uh, maybe you should know about a term of probability because I'm going to talk about in the rule distribution. There are at least. Uh, Four definitions of probability from some classical, geometrical, statistical, Kolmogorov, uh, axiomatic, and so on. Uh, this one is the easiest one, and probability of an uh, event A is the ratio uh, of the numbers of cases and which are in favor to our event A to the number of all cases which are possible, and they are denoted as M. So I'm going to take this fraction N to M and over M because it's pretty easy. If I'm just uh, considering, for example, uh, dice, playing dice with six sides, and I'm just in an event that there will be a number six on the top side of my dice after the, after it's tossing. So I'm going to toss my dice. I will just take a look what is at the top side of the, of the dice, and yeah, I can just for example, write down this number. I can repeat it one more time or many times. So. The number of all possible outcomes it just uh, the stands for M. And you know that if we have classical uh, playing dice with six sides and all, all the sides are equally likely to be uh, tossed, so um, the M is equal to six. six okay? And N is, if I'm interested only in the number six, which should be placed on the top of uh, top side of my dice after it's tossing, then there's only one possible outcome because there is no way how, how other could be uh, number six on the top uh, side of my dice. It, it doesn't have to be uh, the only one six. So it's so only one outcome, uh, sorry, one possible event which is in favor of my event A. I can just, for example, call my event like there is a number six at the top side of my dice after I have just tossed it. So um, it's one over six. Yeah, it's easy. Well, binomial distribution. Now I'm just moving to the distributions. Binomial distributions. So, <clears throat> so binomial distribution uh, is just a, uh, this kind of distribution model as a probability. 
So then the decision is usually more or the probability of something. And the moral case, um, you know, just the moral behind this kind of probability is something which we, we should be interested in because it's, for example, closely related to some physical problems uh, which are relatively important for you also uh, in context of uh, laboratories. So by the decision, what are the probability that there, uh, there are x successes in n attempts? So I'm supposing that x is lower than or equal to n. When a probability of success is uh, equal to uh, p in each of the n attempts. So this is the way how it's marked. <clears throat> An example. Okay, what is the probability? There are exactly x hats in n coin tosses. So we're just supposing I just uh, I just have an unbiased coin. I'm tossing it repeatedly. And what is the uh, probability there is x hats in n, cosis, uh, in n coin tosses when probability that hat is obtained is equal to p. There is a volume mass function uh, which is uh, which should be familiar. You are you should be familiar with this because it's just a calculation of binomial coefficient, which is a high school mathematics, yeah, combinatorial numbers, uh, binomial coefficients. <clears throat> so uh, n choose x multiply by p. And so the story behind this formula is that if I know that the probability of uh, getting a hat is p, so and I suppose that there will be x hat, so I have to uh, power p to x because I suppose that uh, all the coin tosses are mutually independent. So p uh, power to x multiplied by the like the remaining situation. So there will be n minus x. Uh, tails, toss it, and the tail is tossed with the uh, probability one minus p. So one minus p mod, uh, power to n minus it. And these two terms are multiplied uh, uh, themselves because they are mutually dependent. And if uh, I, I don't know if, for example, the, my x hats are, for example, the first x or the last x or some this is in the middle of the n attempt. So I have to take all combat combinations Without definitions, it's just n over and, and choose x. And yeah? this is just the story of the formula. It's it should be uh, could be uh, uh, derived. Also, the variance. Forget on this. What is important? There is a, a, a plot of our uh, probability function. So, supposing that uh, I have a uh, unbiased uh, coin. I just tossed it 100 times, and this is just probably I got uh, I got uh, uh, for example uh, an appropriate number of heads. So supposing that I I got exactly 50 heads from 100 of attempts, the probability is very high, and this is the highest one because it's absolutely native. If I have 100 uh, tosses, 100 attempts of coin tossing. It's very likely that I got something which is somewhere around 50 heads and 50 tails. Yeah, it's just an unbiased coin. Well, it's as easy as this. Right? And this is the story of this plot. If this is somewhere in between 40 to 60 heads, it means that 60 to 40 tails. Yeah, if this is just an unbiased coin. The probability of such a scenario is very likely. Right? It's absolutely many times more likely than, uh, for example, I got. 20 heads and 80 tails. Yeah, we can see that uh, such a board is pretty, pretty close to zero. Why this works this way? Uh, there is something which is called weak law of large numbers, which is kind of a limit uh, limit uh, theorems, one of the limit theorems, the weak one. And uh, it's uh, it claims something like that if we are going to repeat uh, the random experience many, many, many times, then your results you are going to obtain uh, are pretty pretty close to the, the theoretical expected uh, the, uh, numbers so this is the way 100 uh, number uh, 100 coin doses is a relatively high number of coin doses so this is like uh, generated by by a computer um, program yeah but still it, it, it should work in reality also so uh, yeah that's the way how it works it's based on a weak law of large numbers. So, Poisson distribution, important for biophysics. Uh, Poisson distribution is a, let's say a function which returns the probability of a given number of events occurring in a fixed interval of time if these events occur uh, with a known average rate lambda. Examples 
both are from medicine. First example, what is the probability there are exactly 10 heart attacks treated in general faculty hospital on Monday, for example, on yesterday? Yeah. Okay, there could be zero heart attacks, there are zero uh, patients with heart attack, one patient with heart attack, two patients with heart attack, and so on, maybe 20 patients with heart attack. We don't know, yeah? But usually they, like uh, medical actors from uh, cardio coronary uh, department, definitely know the, the average rate, how many heart attacks uh, are there each day. Uh, and there is, for example, you know, there are, maybe there could be about, uh, around 10 heart attacks uh, in, in this hospital per day. So the probability could be relatively large. Uh, the next example. What is the role that there are exactly five ionizing radiation emission events or radiation hittings detected by Geiger Miller counter in one minute? For example, this is this is a variation of one of the tasks we are going to do. Uh, we are going to measure number of our radioactive emissions of radioactive source in I, I guess 20 seconds. So this is also distributed by sample distribution, and this the, the it's described by this strange fraction uh, but important for us is this plot so considering that, that the, for example the geiger miller counter and the uh, radioactive uh, source uh, let's consider that in 20 seconds we got uh, like on average three emission three hittings three hits so then this is just the number or this is just the plot of probabilities for given numbers of uh, these events in number of emissions. So if I got three or four uh, emissions, this is like far more uh, likely than, for example, only one emission and, for example, 15 emissions. Yeah, it's very unlikely to get, for example, 20 emissions in 20 seconds if the average rate is somewhere around three, three emissions per 20 seconds. So we can see that the plot is relatively right skewed. What uh, what is typical for Poisson distribution? Sometimes the Poisson is also called, also called as a distribution of rare events, and usually uh, in medicine, many many uh, kind of variables, many many kind of situations are rare. For example, in general, if there is just a disease in the patients, it's just a rare it's just a rare situation because usually prevalences of disease are pretty close to zero, yeah? for example, it's one over uh, one over 100, something like this. Or these are one over 10,000 and so and so. Yeah. Maybe they are very, very rare. Um, or, okay, there are, there are some nosological diseases which are, which are common, for example, uh, just, car, car, just uh, you know, just the uh, carriers of your uh, tools. This is like something which is uh, what prevalence is about uh, exactly 100 percent. Yeah. But this is uh, like an exception. Like majority of all this is, is uh, these are just a rare situations. So, uh, Poisson distribution is something which is uh, which could be applied for them. Also, uh, measuring measurement of uh, radiation emissions with uh, something which is called Geiger Miller counter or Geiger Miller computer in a given time. Also, it follows uh, <clears throat> and also, what is also interesting to know, uh, don't be surprised when you are going to do this task in our laboratory track that sometimes you get you can get numbers like, for example, 10 or I don't know, 8 or 15. Yeah, you are going to get different numbers because it's just a, it's based on a stochastic process. Yeah. So we, we are not able to predict what will be the number of emissions in the next minute or in the next five minutes or whatever. Yeah. There's just a stochastic layer uh, around around this measure. The, the, the dependence is deterministic, but still in a practic, uh, practical physics, in applied physics, there is just a stochastic layer. Uh, so everything is, uh, has to be like uh, researched within the scope of uh, statistics. Yeah, there's also probability. Okay, normal solution, very important, very important in biological sciences. Just maybe the most common solution in all biological sciences. Examples are very, very, it's just, yeah, it's present in many situations like measurement of body height or intelligent quotient, or 
many, many other applications. What is important for biophysics? Uh, it's a typical distribution for random noise system. It means that if you are going to uh, measure something, some quantity, you would like to uh, get its uh, average number, its best estimate. And you would like to know about, uh, let's say, uh, Okay, you would like to know about its best estimate because it's a typical number you would like to uh, would like to have. Then you have to take into account that uh, the repeated measurements you, are, you have to do, you have to make uh, to get the best estimate, are usually now they usually include a random noise, uh, some random noise. It means that all the solutions are just uh, statically fluctuate around the true value, around the best estimate. Yeah. This is also which which is. Uh, pretty closely connected to uh, random errors in, in uh, practical biophysics. So random noise uh, is uh, random noise simply follows the normal distribution. The Roy function of normalization is something like this. Forget on the formula. You are not supposed to know it. Yeah. So just save your time. Yeah. Study other things. That is like for your information here. You can derive expected uh, value and variance. And what is important? Uh, there are some other theorems. I already talked about uh, the Lyap Lyapunov sentence, Lyapunov law, Lyapunov theorem. And I also talked about uh, weak uh, law of large numbers. Both of these are uh, limit theorems. So regardless of the original probability distribution or the physical quantity, it's important to, to assume this because uh, sometimes we are going to measure something very complex and it's all even more typical for biophysics because in biophysics there are many complex variables quantities which are based partly on biology partly on biological properties of human body partly on some physics theoretical physics or some interaction between these two uh let's say uh, matters and saying this uh, for example to know exact let's say properties or to know exact relations between all presented factors, quantities, and so it's, it's for example, beyond our current knowledge. Yeah? So it means that regardless of the original probability distribution of the physical quantity, because many times in bio, uh, biophysics we don't know the original probability distribution of the physical quantity we would like to measure, an average of many repeat measures tends to be an un unbiased estimate of the original quantity's average. So I'll, I'll already talk about it. But in the first part, I just talked about it uh, like without any assumptions. I just uh, assumed that is, this is simply true, yeah, and it is true. But now we know that this is based on, based on limit theories, both the uh, weak uh, law of large numbers and also the Lyapunov variant of central limit theory, yeah, just for information. So to practical, to be more practical, it means that don't worry about the original probability distribution of the physical quantity you are supposed to measure. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it because definitely it's, it will be very complex. And you are, for example, no one on this earth is able to uh, know it. Yeah. So don't worry about it. But you know, regardless of this, that the, uh, this original quantity's average is go is very likely follow normal distribution. So we know that normal distribution follows this kind of uh, function and it's symmetric. And based on the fact that it's symmetric, so you can you can simply take an average of the measured values and be pretty sure that the calculated measure uh, calculate average from your measured values from your readings, I don't know, 10 readings, 20 readings, doesn't matter. It should be very likely uh, be equal to the true uh, just a theoretical value, theor theoretical expected value, the theoretical best estimate you'd like to know. Yeah, uh, I talked about the uh, uh, lower bound, which should be about 30, yeah, if it is about 30 or more, if you, if, if you have 30 readings or more, then uh, the, num uh, the probability that you are, uh, you are uh, getting in some wrong is a uh, wrong conclusion with this uh, calculation of average is low than one percent yeah but still if we have only for example 20 readings it's still good yeah still good. if we have for example 15 readings still good i think yeah so it still should follow uh, it's a simple properties of uh normal distribution so taking 
average of your sample readings is still okay to use it as an uh, estimate of a true average or best estimate of true value of your quantity. So still holds that in uh, interval uh, uh, average plus minus two standard deviations, there are uh, there should be around ninety five percent of all values, and it's also important to know, also good to know, it's handy handy information because um, if you if you if you going if you're going to report your uh, measurements by mean plus minus two standard deviation, you you also you also give to your reader an information a piece of information that okay in this interval there is for example there is about 95% uh, of all values. Yeah, this is like very, very handy information. Because if there is about 95% of information, it, we can assume that there are almost all of these values there. So this is just a, a probability function of, in this kind, this is just a probability density function. Yeah, it's not a probability mass function because it's a, just a continuous uh, variable, but still. It, this is like very similar to a uh, bino binomial probability mass function, but it's, but it's continuous. So the mean, theoretical mean now is uh, in this example is 100. The sigma like a standard deviation is uh, 1. And as I told you, if we have, uh, if we have uh, a feasible value of uh, readings in your sample, then don't hesitate to calculate average, like arithmetic average of your readings to get your sample average, which should be a good estimate, unbiased estimate of uh, uh, of uh, the true value, or true average of your quantity of your interest. Uh, also, I mentioned before the fact that uh, the variance or the standard deviation of the mean is called standard error of the mean. And maybe you realize that there was just a standard deviation of a sample divided by square root of sample size. It means that the larger is your sample, the, lar the more readings you are going to uh, measure, the lower will be the standard error of the mean. And uh, once the standard error, uh, standard error of the mean is lower enough, it means that your estimate of your, uh, of your average, sample average, also uh, theoretical average, is precise enough as precise as possible so as, as much as many uh, readings you are going to obtain then as precise uh, will be your uh, your uh, estimate of, of the quantities average now we are to, moving towards the statistics part uh, this will be uh, i think very particular i also call it like a applied statistics or statistics in fact theoretical science uh, there is like many many differential Iterations and go close, but this will be just apply statistics. So, how to handle the data? Outliers and extremes. So, this will be just, just a solid, solid issue, solid topics from apply statistics, which uh, could be handy for you, for example, for purposes of uh, practical, yeah, for practical laboratories. Outliers and extremes. Sometimes could happen that uh, you have like a sample of uh, readings, and for example, uh, waste measure of readings uh, seem to be okay. Yeah, they are somewhere around uh, true value, let's say. But for example, one or two of the readings are absolutely far from the rest. And this is this is kind of messy. And you would like to handle with this issue. This could happen yeah, from some reason. Yeah, there will be many, for example, nuisance physical factors for, uh, by uh, by which you should get for you could get for example sometimes a really really uh, um, value which is uh, far from the rest, like they are the, uh, these are possible outliers or extremes. So this could be checked with with, with the workflow. I have an example for you on the next slide. Uh, the uh, traditional method how to detect if there is like a, a, um, outlier or an extreme is using uh, inner or outer fences method. This is like a traditional method which is uh, I think now it's about more than one hundred years old. It was first established by a professor Fisher. Uh, it was just uh, English statistician. Now, if you want to be a good at statistics, you want to be an uh, English Englishman. Yeah? You want to be the origins should be in Great Britain. All great statisticians are from Great Britain. So now we we, are, we 
from Czech Republic where, where we are just simply determined by this, but uh, it's just, uh, it's just, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, uh, Inner and Outer Fences by Professor Fisher, more than 100 uh, years old method, but still good. So let's suppose that we have a, a sample of readings and X, X, uh, I is just a suspicious outlier. So as I told you, the rest of the uh, values are somewhere pretty close to some, for example, average or something like that. But one of the values is absolutely, for example, far uh, from the rest of them. Yeah, it's like a, like a 10 times larger or something like that. There was, there was something massive when you, were, when you measured this uh, suspicious outlier. So how to check if this is an outlier? We can use the in outer fence method. And uh, you have to calculate uh, the first and the third quartile. How to calculate? If you know what is a median, median is just uh, the number. If you just take your sample of the numbers of your readings and sort it in from uh, in increasing order, so from the smallest one to the largest one, so the number which will be in the middle, yeah, this is the median. And the first quartile is the middle number between the smallest number and the median. And the third quartile is the middle number between the, the highest number and the median. Yeah. So in other words, the first quartile is the number which split your sample, uh, your original sample into the lowest, into the 25% uh, of the lowest number and rest of uh, the numbers. And the third uh, quartile is just the number which split splits your uh, sample uh, into the uh, numbers uh, the highest 25% uh, percent of numbers and the rest of the sample. So uh, this could be also calculated by the one of Excel is like uh, absolutely uh, routine kind of calculations. So first and for, uh, third quartile we can calculate by a quartile function in a Microsoft Excel number. And then calculate is first, uh, first quartile minus one and a half uh, multiple of uh, per, uh, third quartile minus per, first quartile this uh, this dif uh, difference is sometimes called interquartile range, and if the if your uh, suspicious outlier is lower than this difference, then it's likely an outlier. It is higher than this than this uh, term, like third quartile plus one and a half uh, over in, uh, inter uh, interquartile range. Then it's also likely an outlier. And if the this factor is uh, increased from one and a half to three, then it's not only an outlier, then it will be uh, also uh, an extreme. Yeah, it means that it's just very, very, very suspicious outlier. Very, okay, just a, even more than an outlier. It's just an extreme. Yeah. So this is the way how to detect it by a mathematical uh, way. When you uh, detect that there are some outliers or extremes in your sample, then if you can. If you have the, the, this option, try to measure this value once more time, if it is possible. And uh, yeah, there are two possible results. You are going to measure it one more time. You get more feasible value, then it's okay. And the second, <laughs> the second output is that you still you are still getting the they are still getting very very unfeasible or messy value. Then uh, it's said that. In such a case, maybe it's not an outlier. It's something which is a result of, uh, I don't know, something which is not, for example, not for us at this moment. And uh, in some ways, college in uh, current science, it's very, uh, it's very usual, useful to check for outliers and extremes because uh, sometimes by study of outliers and extremes, we can, for example, try to, or we can, for example, uh, get some new pieces of knowledge yeah, because there is, for example, this happens on some extremes, uh, situation, extreme combination of situations, and some, for example, uh, margin properties of some, for example, yeah, some uh, commonly known uh, uh, relation dependencies. So, study of outliers and extremes is uh, also a way how to, for example, gain some new pieces of knowledge in physics. And if you are not able to uh, uh, re uh, repeatedly measure our suspected outliers or extremes, you can uh, choose for a safe option. So just omit them from our sample, just to delete them, just remove them from our sample. Or, yeah, this is this is just a very safe, uh, very very safe uh, option. We, what we can do if we are not able to repeat it, uh, measure it one more time. 
Okay, so this was for outer sign exchange. So typical situation, you have got a sample, all of the numbers except for one or two are okay. They are pretty close to an average, but one or two or some or limited number of uh, limited count of numbers are strange. Yeah, they are pretty far from from the average uh, sample average. So if this is something like if this is your situation, try to apply inner and outer fences and if we have a door, um, do the measurement one more time, do it. If not, and you would like to feel safe, remove this this suspicious outlier from your from your sample box. But this is something uh, typical way how to plot uh, continuous variable uh, for for example some subset or subgroup or group. Uh, it's also based. Uh, it's also studied by Professor Fisher and. Um, uh, Current version of Microsoft Excel is able to do it for you. Yeah, this it was just a great problem uh, for uh, thousands of years that uh, Microsoft Excel was not able just to plot this kind of uh, chart. But Boxplot is now a, uh, you can Boxplot is now could be provided to you by by Microsoft Excel. So, um, what is the how, how we can read this kind of just read yeah, this kind of uh, chart? So. Uh, this uh, thick line in the middle stands for median. So median in this sample was uh, somewhere above zero. This uh, edge here, the edge of the box, the lower edge of the box, stands for the first part. So the first part was just maybe uh, minus one half. Yeah? This edge, the upper one, stands for the third quartile. So and this is something maybe 0 0.7. And there are also some uh, segments. So this uh, upper segment stands for maximum, yeah, maximum in our sample. So maximum was somewhere uh, around maybe one and 80, one and eight, yeah, something like this. And the minimum, this is the tricky part. So wait a moment. This, this could be like a minimum, yeah, minus two, but there is something strange. There is a uh, empty dot here. So this couldn't be minimum because there, there is one more value, you know, which is even uh, lower than the minimum. So, and this this is the way how usually a box plot detects an outlier because uh, in box plots in Excel and in uh, every other statistical software, box plots are programmed to display for you possible outliers and extremes. So, this is the way how the possible outliers is. Uh, is uh, plotted. So if I'm going to uh, take first quartile here and multiply the, the third minus first, so this is the third minus first, so this is this uh, range by uh, one half, so I get maybe this and this. So I think that uh, the length of this segment is exactly one and a half of this interquantile range, so the difference between the third and the first quartile. And since this number is even lower than this uh, difference, given by uh, inner fence method, in an outer fence method. It's a likely an outlier. And this is the way how the box plot shows it, shows this fact to you. There is this empty dot and this is also the outlier. So use box plots if you can for your uh, samples because this is a very, very elegant way, very smart way how it can be, how, how the uh, outliers or extent could be plotted for you without any calculations yeah so this is the way how the external is so so we can say that in our sample i don't know how many uh, numbers uh, is in our sample because uh, it's not possible to realize from a box but we should have the original numbers because we uh, since we are since we are able to uh, to plot this kind of chart but there is one outlier one suspicious outlier one possible outlier uh, its value is somewhere around minus two that two maybe and this is the way how the box plot is going to uh, show to do that there is uh, one possible outlier. Missing values. It could also happen, typically in biophysics. Uh, it, it means that you have a sample of uh, you have a sample, sample of uh, readings, but from some reason or another, you weren't able, for example, to measure uh, all the values or some of the values are, for example, kind of efficient. You have you know that, for example, the 
uh, they are for example ruined by some I don't know or everything error or whatever so we have to remove them so then you have a missing values so what to do if you are from some reason uh, if you need uh, for example from some reason uh, all of your values populated you can uh, substitute this or replace this missing values by an average value of the other values if this if we are talking about a numerical variable or with a mode so the most frequent value if we are talking about a category variable yeah, this is a way how or heuristic how to do it but i would say that in our practical uh most of the tasks are based on unidimensional unidim measuring of, of variables it means that if there are uh, if there is one or two or something like this one or two missing values i think that your measurement and your protocol your laboratory work is going to work still it's going to still to work yeah and there are maybe some uh, exceptions in case that okay in case that uh we are interested in uh for example some uh, relations of two quantities so we have two dimensional uh, let's say relationship of two quantities and for example so it means that you have two uh points for each measurement two values for each measurement then in case that you have uh, a missing value in one of these two uh, values for a given measurement then you have a problem because for example we are not able to uh to plot a two-dimensional chart yeah, 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 it's just a scatter plot then in just such, such a case you can simply remove the uh the measurement with uh, missing values that's a safe scenario or the second one which is not so much safe but it's also clever and it could be done is that you are going to replace the missing value by by an average uh, value of the other values or the remaining values in, in such a quantity checking for normality uh, like to be practical the most easy way how to check for normality is to use a histogram it's a kind of pot i prepared some uh, examples for you uh, if you are more into statistics we can use uh, some statistical tests so normal test uh, but uh, this, these are for this uh, test uh, you need some more advanced software like uh, spss or stata or r or python or um, i think that no one of these tests is able to be done in microsoft excel so shapiro will chi uh, squared as a goodness of the kolmogorov smirnov very national war degostino omnibus test and so but uh, these are as i told you uh, they request some special software. What could be done uh, in Microsoft Excel in, uh, instead of besides the histogram checking is uh, calculation skewness and kurtosis of the data. So we look in Excel. Uh, it's just a function for skewness and kurtosis. Yeah? It means these two properties are uh, typical properties of normal distribution. And if the skewness is uh, lower than absolute value, is lower than this. Uh, square root and there is a lower than absolute value, uh, of course, uh, lower than this square root, then uh, the data uh, very likely follows the normal distribution. The n term in this fraction stands for sample size as usual. Yeah. So this could be done in Excel, but checking the histogram is, from my opinion, absolutely sufficient to check for normality. So this is a histogram of uh, <clears throat> the first. Present a lot of histogram. Okay, so this is a kind of chart that on a horizontal axis there is a um, there is, these are just the units of the original quantity. Yeah, it could be body height and it will be centimeters, or it will be, for example, uh, <clears throat> some radioactivity, it will be just becquerels and so on and so on. Doesn't matter uh, from uh, at this moment. And on the vertical axis, we are going to get absolute or relative frequency, so it means that. Uh, values in, in our case uh, in values for number from one to from zero to one half i'm just in this column from zero to one half there are exactly 20 values yeah 20 values uh, such that the values were in the interval from zero to one half there were about uh, about seven values uh, in interval minus one to minus one and a half yeah something like this. and you can read it this way so this is like the way uh, that uh, I've got just the original values of my quantity, which were measured by me, and uh, I, can, I, I, I did this kind of contingency. In fact, I did contingency by a table, and 
uh, I counted up the, uh, uh, the numbers of equivalences of the numbers in each of the measurements of in each of these intervals. The number of intervals is sometimes tricky because it could uh, change the story of data. But there is a rule which is usually implemented in Microsoft so other software, and it's called Rouge, uh, sorry, Sturges law of uh, number of uh, bins in his in histogram. So it's done automatically, so we don't have to know about it. Yeah. And what we are interested uh, in, if we would like to check for normality, try to realize that uh, I'm just uh, now focused on the tops of these columns, and I just try to realize if it's possible just to try to envelope these columns, the tops of these columns, by a Gaussian bell-shaped curve. I mean, this Gaussian bell-shaped curve. And if we have some, if we're able to imagine it, I think that it could be, in this case, that there could be a very nice bell-shaped curve, Gaussian curve here. So this is the gram is a histogram of uh, measured values, which we feel free to assume that they follow, they follow uh, normal data, normal distribution. Histogram so two. Okay, still the same story. Uh, on a hard axis, there's just original, original uh, uh, quantity. On a vertical axis, yeah, these are absolute frequencies. Okay, in this case, I think that no one of us is able to imagine there will be just a Gaussian bell shaped curve because this is like maybe a one half, right half of the Gaussian bell shaped curve, yeah, but not the whole one, so not the entire one. So in, in this case, uh, I don't think that uh, the data of my quantity x follows follow uh, the normal normal distribution. Sometimes this kind of data are called right skewed because they are just skewed in this way, right skewed. They are skewed from the left to the right. And the last example, okay, maybe there could be a bell-shaped Gaussian curve. Yeah, maybe it is like it could be, uh, yeah, it could be, it could be, but it's not like uh, so much nice example of a normal distributed data like with the first one. This is far pretty, pretty more closer to normal distribution than this one. But still, there could be a normal, a normal distributed Gaussian bullshit curve here, yeah? but not so much nice. And I would say that uh, these data are a bit left skewed, since that they are just skewed this way. Yeah? They are skewed from the right to the left. Right? Because this, the left tail, in other words, the left tail of this data is longer than the right tail. So, they are left skewed. Left skewed. Curve heading. The last part I'd like to talk about. <clears throat> this is a important topic, but uh, unfortunately connected to uh, high, uh, college mathematics. But I'm going to uh, omit the college mathematics, and I will just try to talk about the let's say logic behind the curve heading in layman terms here. So the curve fitting is just a process of constructing a curve or mathematical function that has the best fit to a series of data points. This is like a very, very nice definition, but what does it mean? Uh, there's just a uh, chart for us, scatter plot school. Well, okay, so supposing, let's suppose that I've got, I've measured two quantities, x and y. Quantity uh, x was measured such that the, the, its values were from 0 to 100, and quantity y was measured at, that such that its values were uh, from maybe minus 50 to 150, something like this. So each measurement uh, consists of two values, x coordinate and y coordinate. Yeah? And for example, I would like to know if there is like a relationship between these two quantities. And by plotting the scatter plot using uh, x and y coordinates, this could be simply done in Microsoft Excel or in any other uh, software. It seems that there could be like a linear uh, relation, linear dependency of the y on x or x on y, yeah, because it's a multi uh, and directional kind of relationship. So, um, yeah, because the points are 
very, very well distributed around this potential uh, line here. Yeah? So the curve fitting means that uh, I suppose, based for example on a theory or based on some experience or based on, for example, the data, yeah, sometimes we don't know, for example, enough theory or the theory, for example, uh, beyond our current knowledge of, of this to of the topic. So in such a case, we can rely only on our data. But for example, let's suppose that we know the theory that there should be like a linear, and there should be like a linear uh, relationship between these two quantities. <laughs> then it means that uh, I can just make the curve fitting. So I would like to find such a line that is uh, that fits the relationship between the x and y uh, with some good properties. Uh, I would like to find the best curve fitting yeah, and in, within some sense. And what does it mean? <clears throat> so linear linear fitting means that I I am just finding for uh, okay in in this simple uh, example I'm just uh, searching for two numbers two parameters because you know that if we have a two dimensional uh, chart just a plane chart then a line in a plane is determined by two numbers because uh, by two points let's say because uh, yeah if we are just in a plane then two points are enough to determine a line because we can connect these two points and the line is given by these two points so uh, these two parameters are usually called slope intercept in, in, intercept is a, a parameter uh, which stands for a, uh, intersection of a regression line, the red line, y axis is zero. So it seems that the intercept here is somewhere around zero. And slope is just the angle between the regression line, the best curve fitting line, and horizontal axis. Yeah? To be more specific, it's just an arcus tangens of this, uh, of this angle. Well, so how to find these two parameters to determine this best fitting curve? So there are some rules how to do it. Uh, maybe you have already heard about something which is called sum of squares. Yeah? What does it mean? It means that uh, if I have uh, uh, this kind of formula, which is in fact a uh, formula, formula for line or hyperplane formula uh, for just more uh, variables. So y is my y and x1 is my, uh, is my x variable. So I have to find beta 0 and beta 1 forget on this rest there because in case that we have only two quantities I'm interested only in this part beta 0 and beta beta 0 is intercept beta 1 is slope and the logic how to do it is to minimize because uh, if I'm going to uh, expand this formula there is the last term which is called uh, residual or it's just a term uncertainty term and of course we'd like to minimize our uncertainty in uh, within the best uh, within the curve fitting so the rule is that uh, the typical rule, also maybe 100, more than 100 uh, years old, is that uh, we are using the sum of minimal sum of squares. We want to minim minimize sum of squares of the residuals. So if I'm going to rewrite this formula, and as I told you, forget on beta two, beta k, I have only uh, uh, y, beta zero, and beta one, and this term consider epsilon. So I'm going to uh, calculate set squares, sum of squares of the of uh, of these residuals. So I have to rewrite it like y minus beta zero, beta one, and forget on this rest, and power to two, yeah, of course. And I I, I just I'm just searching for such a value of beta zero and beta one that this summation is the lowest possible. Yeah, this is the logic of Minimum, minimum, uh, sum of squares of residuals. It could be done by software, it, it could be done, uh, even in Microsoft Excel. What is also interesting in such a such a trivial case that we have only two quantities, it could be also derived like analytically using some uh, a set of uh, ordinary uh, differential equations, ODEs, yeah, but uh, also forget on this, but it could be derived. Yeah? For this kind of trivial example, for a more ex for more complex the more exponential variables, not only one, but for example, it will be just more x x one x two x three and so on. Or there will be some, for example, terms with uh, some you know, squared or power to three, or for example, some exponentials or logarithms. It could be also it could be in such a case we are not able uh, usually to 
uh, derive it analytically, but we have to use uh, some numerical estimations, which are partly based on maximum likelihood estimation, some variance, and on some numerical iterative methods like Newton wraps, so usually method, iterative method, and so on. Forget on these terms, but uh, just in case it, you are going to uh, find it somewhere. Okay, but what is important, also you have to need some appropriate software which is going to do the stuff, it's going to do the algebra, to do the numerical iteration, so because to believe me that uh, the only one example which we are able to do it like uh, on a <laughs> using pencil paper is this case that it is there's one uh, response variable and one exploited variable this could be uh, another derived yeah uh, but uh, for more complex uh, uh, cases could be it, it could be done like by pen, pencil pen uh, pen paper and pencil well um uh, in one of the tasks uh, in the laboratory track, we are going to do something like this. We are going to fit some bunch of points, so some cloud of points, let's say, and you have to uh, find the best uh, fitting curve. Yeah, it, uh, it's, it's possible to do it in Microsoft Excel, so you can do it in Excel. But yeah, Excel. Uh, there are also some metrics uh, how to uh, evaluate if your uh, Curve fitting was, let's say, uh, of a good quality. Uh, one of these metrics is called R squared, and the closer is just like R and power to two R squared. Uh, the closer is the R squared to one, the best or the, the better was your uh, curve fitting. So uh, it's like a metric to do. So this is like the stuff we are going to do in one of the tasks. That's why I'm just uh, talking about it because you can see there is something like a Mathematics, which is maybe not so uh, well done by you, but sorry, I forget on the formulas. But the logic is that you are you are, you are just uh, supposing to find such a curve or line which bestly which, which just fits uh, the uh, the points. We are able to we are able to plot them in some way uh, in the in, you know, just in. You just pull them let's say let's say well in some meaning okay so um and the last thing i would like to talk about is also connected to one of the tasks critical task and uh sometimes uh, studying as in a practical uh i just uh i just saw that uh this could be a kind of problematic for you as students so i would like to talk about it a bit more here so uh, this is just a task which was connected with something which is called Lambert Bear's law. And the Lambert Bear's law claims that uh, if we have just the quantity of light, which is uh, usually marked as uh, capital A, and this quantity of light is absorbed by a substance which is dissolved in a fully transmitting solvent, uh, which is described by a molar absorption coefficient epsilon, then this quantity of light which is absorbed is directly proportional to the concentration C of the substance, which is uh, dissolved in, a, in the solvent, and the path length uh, marked by L of the light through the solution, uh, through the glass or through the kivet or something like that. Choose if you are going to rewrite it in more mathematical way, you are going to get this formula. Absorption, uh, absorbance A is proper, is equal to uh, this, uh, this product of molar absorption coefficient epsilon concentration of uh, our uh, substance in, in a solvent and path length l through which the uh, line has to go through well um let's suppose uh, this is like a scenario absolutely similar to what we are going to do in your practical so that's why i'm just talking about it now let's suppose that we have measured the absorbances uh, capital A1 to capital A5, so we have measured it five times. And we measured also concentration C1 to C5. And we know uh, ups, uh, the molar absorption coefficient epsilon and the uh, uh, path length L. We want to know the unknown concentration C5, but the other concentrations are known. So it means that in practice, that in the practical, you have four uh, solutions in solvents such that uh, they are just labeled by their concentration. So the first four concentrations are known for you, but the last uh, 
but the last uh, concentration is unknown for it was the last so the last solution, solution is like not labeled by a known concentration but still you know that this is just still the same still the same uh solution but uh, of uh, unknown concentration so you know that the more absolute concentration will be still the same although the path is still the same for all the repeated measures because it's still the same period yeah well um how to calculate the c5 if you know this number uh, this law lambert bear law you can for example you can give the idea that you can try to isolate c from this uh, right hand side part of the equation like by division of uh, epsilon l a good idea try to do it but uh the best way how to do it there are two ways which are let's say acceptable one is okay and one is absolutely the best and this uh, i'm going to talk about, about both of them so the first one which is okay let's try to suppose that we have for example uh, measured it from uh, for the first uh, concept uh, for the first solution we know absolute bands for for it and concentration for the first solution you can try to put uh, proportions of left hand sides and right hand sides of this formula so i just giving uh, i'm just giving this kind of uh, i'm just giving this kind of our uh, fractions and it just simply rather than this kind of form but i just divide it two left hand sides and two right hand sides so i know that i know a5 and a1 i didn't know i don't know um, c5 and i know c1 so i can try to uh, i can see that uh, the epsilon and l is not necessary for this equation because they are both in numerator and denominator so i can uh, try to isolate c5 by c5 is equal to a5 multiplied by c1 over a1 yeah this is the way how to do it i just uh choose for uh a1 but i like also can i also just pick for example a2 or a3 or a4 it doesn't matter yeah so in the, the second the third or the fourth uh concentration still the first four are of a known concentration yeah this is this could work this could work but you can realize that by this approach this which is acceptable we just simply omit the rest of our measurements so we just simply omit the second the third and the fourth measurements so how to incorporate them into uh, into this uh, kind of uh, derivations so i can try to calculate uh, i can simply rewrite this uh, formula also as of proportions of two left hand sides and two right hand sides but uh, I'm using in uh, nominate uh, yeah, in numerator the parameters for the fifth solution, which is of an unknown concentration, and in den uh, in denominators I'm just using uh, uh, average values for the measured uh, measured parameters. So I know that the first four uh, first four solutions were, were of a known concentration. So I know both a1 a2 a3 a4 and i also know c1 c2 c3 c4 so i'm just i just put uh mean value in the denominator now what i just did here is that i isolate the c5 also i can realize that i can uh, try to uh, omit epsilon and l because it's both in the median denominator and I can realize that by isolation c5 is equal to a5 uh, multiplied by uh, this fraction of uh, sums of uh, concentrations and absorptions and also if you want to i can like artificially divide both numerator and denominator by four to make from this summation to just to uh, make the summation rather uh, uh, an averaging so i can write it this way this is, uh, this is just a uh, average of the first four concentration and it's just average of the first four absorbances and now it's pretty clear that by this way i also got c5 so the unknown concentration for the last the fifth solution but i used all all the previous known uh, all the previous solutions of known concentration so by this you can see that if i uh, if i uh, uh, Calculate C5 as a A5 absolute 5 by uh, multiplied by this fraction. I used all the previous measurements. Then, if I 
picked only for, for one of them was uh, the first one or second one or the or, or the third or the fourth, but not the rest of them. So this one is definitely more robust. And why this uh, estimate is more robust? It's uh, based on the fact that I've already talked about it that uh, the standard error of the mean because now I'm just using mean uh, average value here. Standard error of the mean is usually uh, lower than standard deviation of all the sample. And if I know that uh, I, I can calculate the standard deviation based on the first four numbers, and the standard error of the mean will be uh, uh, square root of uh, sample size times lower. It means square root of four. It means two times lower. So the so the precision of this uh, way of calculation C5 is two times higher than this way if I'm pick, picking only one of the solution and I'm just omitting the rest of them. I'm just omitting the three of the measured. So it's just, uh, just a useless omitting of information here. So a uh, message for you is that if you are going to calculate some, if we are supposed to calculate some derived quantities, uh, which you should know about them, for example, their average, but you are uh, you have to measure a, di a different kind of uh, let's say quantity because in this in this uh, task you measured all absorbances but you are uh, interested in concentrations yes you have to find the derivation how to uh, how to isolate uh, formula for out in formula how to isolate uh, concentration what is the concentration equal to based on the absorbances so message is if you are able to incorporate summations or averaging in the this kind of formulas do it because your estimate will be then uh, several times more precise because of the standard error means will be is lower than uh, standard deviation of the whole of uh, the entire sample so do it if you are able to do uh, use summations or averaging do it instead of only picking a separate values yeah that that was the message and as I told you, this is one of the particular tasks we are going to uh, handle uh, within, within the laboratory track. Yes, our references, these, these books are very, very traditional. I think that uh, for this course of biophysics in winter time, they are not necessary. Try to focus rather on anatomy and histology and so on. Biophysics is important, so uh, try to uh, attend the lectures, at least in virtual form. But uh, regardless, regarding this first topic like error measurement and internal statistics and so on, uh, I think that the study of these books is not necessary. If you are strongly uh, interested, then all of these books are great. Yeah? But I think that these slides should be pretty you now, and maybe this video recording. Okay, guys, so that's it. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me. You can write me an email. Please prefer the first one, which is uh, associated with the with uh, the medical faculty, or you can uh, you can ask me a question, for example, why the Microsoft Teams, which is uh, just a platform we are going to use for particles, or let's believe that we are able to just to meet ourselves, like in person, for example, at our at our department. Okay, so thank you for your attention, and. Okay, have a nice time in such a weird current times. Yeah, yeah, just living in.